12, 2019. Second. Trustee Rye, Trustee Latham. You see that we're voting electronically, and there we are. And uh, the same for consent items. So so moved. Moved. Trustee Pauls and Trustee Newfeld. <laughs> and we have some delegations. The first one is student delegation. I'll turn it over to Superintendent Gotti. Right, so I'd like to welcome all of uh, these fine young people from our middle schools. I understand you recently uh, made a presentation at the middle school conference, and uh, so much so you made a sufficient impression on folks there that we thought we'd bring you to this meeting to share some of the aspirations you shared with the throng of teachers who were there. So I'm not sure who I'm going to turn this over to. Mr. Levings, are you the point person here? Okay. I mean, the conference was hosted hosted by by your school, so perhaps it makes sense that you should start us off. Yes, I'd like you to stand right there. <laughs> the trap door is right there. <laughs> and, and we can't. Otherwise, we can't. People who are watching at home can't hear you unless you're underneath. That's there. Right. So, and there are thousands watching you as we speak. <laughs> cameras A couple of them are watching the Canucks game, but most are watching. You. So uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, we just uh, finished up last week the um, 2019 Middle School Conference. It was the largest ever. We had uh, 408 um, registrants, participants, uh, although people came from Vancouver, from Langley, from Chilliwack, from Mission, um, and about 99% of people from uh, from our Abbotsford Middle School. And so we, it, we I, Mr. Cocker and I, who's our vice principal, we wanted to kind of switch things up and make things a little bit more interactive uh, this year for our middle school conference. And we kind of thought to ourselves, what a what a better way to uh, kick off our middle school conference than having real live students. Uh, so I put a message out to uh, my colleagues, and lots of them are here are here tonight. And I said, send me two students from each of your schools that you feel represent your school and aren't shy in, uh, as they're going to be speaking in front of 500 people, because I was wow. actually hoping for 500. Uh, and so these fine young uh, ladies and gentlemen were sent to me, and it's just been a, a pleasure working with them. They were over at Reimer six times to get ready for this. Wow. And I'd like to say that uh, we have two teachers on staff, uh, Mr. Baines, uh, Mr. Tursuk Baines and Ms. Chantel Ewart. Uh, they put uh, tons of time and effort behind the scenes. Uh, so without our teachers at Reimer working with this group, uh, it wouldn't have gone as well as it went. So I'm going to turn it over to them. We kind of split up into two groups. We have an AM and a PM. That's how they call themselves. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to call on up uh, Will from Claiborne. And we're going to, you think the kids are really good with uh, video games and stuff? They had such a hard time with this clicker. They <laughs> <laughs> play Xbox with like 15 different controls. So let's see if they can master this clicker. Let's go. <laughs> Point to the computer over there. All right. Where am I? Here? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Um, as a district, we tend to be fairly competitive. Our, midders, our middle schools often form bitter rivalries, among themselves and within themselves. And for athletics, that's OK. But for academics and student life, it's counterproductive. It is our common belief that the best things in education come when we fit together. Hmm. And to that end, there are a few things we hope we will all leave here today. As students, we want to learn through collaboration. We want to feel motivated about our schoolwork. We want to express our learning physically through movement. We want to understand the material. And most of all, most of all, and this one hits home hard for me, and I'm sure it does for a lot of you too, we want to feel safe and comfortable in every room, in every building in this district. And when we don't, we want to feel safe and comfortable telling you about it. I'm sure we've all experienced a class where we sit for 50 minutes and listen to a teacher talk. From my perspective, and a student's perspective, we like being interactive and proactive. We, it's easier to learn information through experiences rather than lectures. 
conducting more experiments or hands-on projects would help students retain more information, especially kinesthetic learners. Scientific research shows that working with objects help us remember more. I love interacting and working with different people, and I know my classmates do as well. Students love to be active, a lot of them at least, but all students have to be active. Kids end up wiggling in class, fidgeting with their hair, or doodling on their work. If we have more interactive lessons in group work, this would help us focus and learn more. Motivating us to be enthusiastic about learning is very important. One of the ways to motivate us is to integrate education with our interests, hobbies, life, or experiences. One of the, oh. In my case, integrating my silence with art and music definitely, definitely helps me to finish them efficiently and successfully. For example, last year in English, we learned about different perspectives on writing. We could, we, when we finished the unit, can we start over again? <laughs> yeah. Motivating us to be enthusiastic about learning is very important. One of the ways to motivate us is to integrate education with our interests, hobbies, life, or experiences. In my case, integrating my assignments with art and music definitely helps me to finish them efficiently and successfully. For example, last year in English, we learned about different perspectives in writing. When we finished the unit, we got to choose a form of artistic expression to present our understandings about the unit. We could choose either music, drama, dance, or visual arts. As a result, most of us successfully finished the unit and also enjoyed the process because it didn't feel like homework since we weren't doing what we enjoyed. Hmm. According to the research, the neuroscience of joyful education, it tells us that when the fun stops in learning, learning can also stop, and that the pre-learning takes place where classroom experiences are enjoyable and relevant to a student's life. Every, everybody has their own different, unique ways of learning, and I believe that teachers need to find a way to tap into that for us to be more successful at school. Thank you. Thank you. It feels like we should be clapping after each of yeah. these. We're gonna, no, 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 we're gonna hold off. We're gonna hold off, and I'm watching. Okay, please, let's go hold off. A minor mistake teachers make when they often teach a lesson is that they think the work given is pretty easy and able to complete. Though the mistake they've made is that sometimes they don't often think from a student's perspective. Now, the work we've received is probably so confusing that we end up sitting for what feels like hours and hours, which would cause us to never finish the work anyways. Instead of giving us the work right away, teachers should take some time to give us a brief introduction about what we are learning about to make sure it's understandable to us, since most students probably experienced acquiring the work without knowing what was actually supposed to go on the sheet. After giving out a worksheet, teachers should take a couple of minutes going around to each student, checking their comprehension more often to see if we understand and are able to accomplish it. Teachers should also ask students to reflect upon what they've said to make sure we know what we're learning about. For example, Asking students to summarize is a great way to know if you've paid attention to what is going on in class. These are a few great teaching strategies teachers could use. Overall, I think teachers do a great job teaching us, but just in case, make sure students' work they've received isn't too confusing to them as well as accomplished. Thank you. An hour of class is a long time to sit still and focus on a worksheet. After a while, you start getting off task. I love to be active and play sports, so when I have to sit for an entire day of school, I can get bored. I've done a few activities in class where we actually got to stand up and represent our learning through physical activity, but I really wish we could do it more. Research shows that when students use all of their senses, it helps the brain create pathways that make it easier and quicker to retain information. It allows students to experiment through trial and error, learn from their mistakes, and understand the gap between theory and practice. Creating a visual representation and having us interact with each other about what we've learned in class will not only help us learn the information better, but it can also be quite enjoyable. Being taught in ways to give students a chance to get active and have fun is something I really wish teachers would focus on more. Giving all types of learners a chance to succeed is something that is important, and I'm sure my classmates would agree.
One more. Can I trust you? Do you care about me? These are the main questions asked by youth today. I believe teachers should learn about depression and anxiety. These are two very important topics that need to be talked about. Did you know that someone dies from suicide every 40 seconds? If they were discussed more often, maybe suicide rates would decrease. Youth would know how to deal with these emotions by understanding more about what they are feeling and would take it more seriously. By the time the seven of us finish speaking, there will have been 35 or more suicides among 15 to 19 year olds worldwide. I want these numbers to go down, so I challenge the teachers to create an environment that allows students to come to them when they're having troubles with their mental health, to allow them to feel safe and supported. Accessible. A person typically runs in a position of authority or importance. They are friendly and easy to talk to. In other words, approachable. Teachers are always there for students to talk to, but most kids don't realize that. We are too worried about what others will think if we do, and we don't realize we have someone we can go to and take our issues to. In grade 7, my teacher started this thing called Bunch with Mockington. It's where you could pick a buddy and have lunch with him. The thing I liked about this is that he was intentional, and that made a difference with us. This teacher's idea trickled down the line, and now this year, one of my grade 8 teachers who's in her first year of teaching started a thing similar called Tiba Tillman. When teachers react to students, it can make a big difference. It is nice that my classmates and I have this opportunity to be able to talk to our teachers, teachers and not in a classroom setting. I'm not saying every teacher has to do it this way. All I'm saying is that the more teachers react to students, the more we might come to with problems that might get missed. Because everyone has something to say. We just need the right time to say it. Thank you. Even though our schools can be competitive and have our differences, we also need to work well together and we need to share and use our differences and similarities for the better. We need to learn to work together as schools and in classrooms. We need to feel com comfortable asking teachers for emotional support and educational support. Physical activity and motivation is important and we need to learn to be comfortable with it so that we can help others feel this way as well. In conclusion, we need to learn how to cooperate and feel good about working together and interacting with each other. Thank you. And I, we basically, we didn't, I didn't want to give the students, I didn't want to write their scripts for them and make everything super polished. I wanted, at least gave them the question, um, what would you want our, our middle school staff to, to learn at a pro day? And just kind of left them away. And then Mr. Baines and Ms. Ewart uh, helped them through their grammar and just kind of uh, helped them uh, work out through their slides, et cetera. Then we went on and we had uh, two keynote speakers. Uh, one was a lady named uh, Taylor Barr, a recent graduate from um, Robert, uh, from um, the Abbotsford School District. And then we had Dr. Kimberly Shonat Reichel, who's a worldwide SEL expert. Then we went to a couple of sessions. Mr. Horton put on a session. Uh, um, about 50 different um, session A and session B, then we, we came back because we felt we just wanted to kick off the, the uh, conference with a bit of a challenge and then to end it we, um, we asked the teachers, the students to thank their, some of their particular teachers that they've had in middle school. And that was a real like tear-jerker moment. Those uh, teachers were just so pumped. They were like, oh, because we didn't tell them, right? They were just all sitting there and all of a sudden the kids go, well, oh, did you tell them? <laughs> so they just kind of went out, you can imagine 400 people, lights are off, everyone's ready to go to the teacher, and the students come up and, and clicked on there's a picture of their teachers. And I tell you, those uh, middle school staff were just so uh, pumped and so excited about that. So I didn't tell the PM uh, shift that they have to present or that they get to present uh, tonight, but in case you want, were there any PM people that want to come up and just kind of, just, okay, three of you, come on up. So. <laughs> so they don't have their slideshow, but I just felt that if we had the first session, had a chance to talk, these guys also um, should be able to talk about uh, who they thanked. Hi, my name is Morgan. I'm a student at Thayer Middle. 
My teachers, Mrs. Burroughs and Mr. Piper, help guide not only me, but my classmates too. I always knew that they were there for me. I was talking to Mr. Piper once, and he taught me an important lesson about not letting technology get in the way of your relationships. Mm. He said if something were to ever happen to him, he would want his family to know that he hadn't wasted a moment that he could with them. Mrs. Burroughs taught me how to keep cool, even when things were difficult. When my class was misbehaving, she would not yell, but calmly took care of the situation. When we were worried or stressed or uncertain, she always gave us, she always reassured us with what information we needed. I'm so grateful for both of these wonderful teachers, and I would not be here for them. And I would like to say thank you in another language. Asante Asana. Hi, my name is Harmander, and I go to Chief Dan George. I would like to start off by saying thank you to my grade 6 teacher, Madame Livoran, for teaching me so much French. And when I came to Chief Dan, I was really nervous, but thanks to her, I felt like I fit in. Thank you to my principal, Mr. Singh, who taught me how to be respectful, kind, and overall a nice person in general. Thank you to my home ec teacher, Mr. Lily, for teaching me how to cook and act. Also, about the Lion King, our play, Lion King play our school did. Thank you to Ben. In grade 6, I really wanted to play percussion. And our band teacher, Mr. Hawkins, said I could. And it was amazing. This year, we get to go to San Francisco, and I'm super excited. <laughs> Lastly, the web team. When I first came to Chief Dan, I was super nervous. But thanks to the web team, I felt like I fit in, and I felt comfortable. So I decided to join this year. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mason, and I go to Eugene Yard. And I feel so lucky to have all my teachers I have because I wouldn't know anything without them. I'm very grateful that I could be at this. I'm very grateful that I could be at Eugene Armour for grade seven. I have lots of amazing teachers, but I would like to say who really helped me through everything. First, I'm going to start off with my homeroom teacher, Mr. Yeomans. He is always singing, and I don't really ever see him mad. He always comes to school happy, and he makes everything positive. He always makes sure that everyone is smiling and just as happy as he is. The second teacher that I'm talking about is my pod teacher, Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor is always making people laugh and making sure that nobody's stuck on a question. She comes to school with a positive attitude and is amazing in every way. I'm so lucky to have her as my pod teacher, and I don't think I can ask for a better one. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> you could go on forever. <laughs> Hello, my name is Shua Cho, and I'm a student who goes to Asia Sumas Abbotsford School of Integrated Arts. To start off, I'd like to thank all teachers and staff who always work hard and help every single student to each develop their life skills, academic skills, and personal growth as well. In my case, I'm very grateful for being able to participate in activities that I'm passionate about, such as performing with the music groups in our school and participating in art competitions. I especially thank Mrs. Bennett, our principal, for providing me all these wonderful opportunities that I would have never got if I didn't come to the school. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Danny. I attend Eugene Manor and I would like to say thank you to all my teachers, such as my grade 6 teachers, Mr. Gill and Ms. McPhee, as well as my band teacher, Ms. Bueller. Ms. McPhee was always willing to help out a student during her free time and went out of her way to make sure we felt comfortable talking to her. Mr. Gill always made classes fun and gave us lots of chances to learn in ways where we had a hands-on experience. And Ms. Bueller is always teaching us strategies to learn new songs in fun and easy ways and by giving advice in a positive and encouraging tone. When I'm at school, I always feel comfortable and know that I can get help whenever I need it. Because of these small things, I have received many wonderful opportunities such as this one. My teachers have greatly affected my time so far at Eugene Manor and made it a fun place to be. Thank you. So that's how they uh, presented. Um, it was a huge success. It was a lot of fun. Um, I had a, uh, a great amount of pleasure getting to know these students within. They were a really cool group. They, they wanted the Wi-Fi password. We gave it to them. <laughs> um, they, within, within 30 seconds, they came in. They had already started, started uh, um, gone on Learn 34 and set up a, a, a Google Doc. And they've made a little uh, is it a Google Hangout group where they're all kind of connecting with, the, with one another. So a uh, great group of uh, middle school students. And uh, thank you to their parents and their principals for uh, helping us pull this off.
that kind of should end it. I mean, I mean <laughs> comments, questions? Trustee Wilson. Thank you, Chair Peterson. Students, thank you so much. The reason that I sit at this table and I come here on Tuesday nights and give up these few hours is for your benefit. Um, and it's also because you inspire me. And those were great words. Really appreciate them. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Trustee and Mason. at the center of education are, ta-da, the <laughs> students. So well done. Um, and thank you in terms of the organization to allow the student voice. Um, it is so important that we hear from our kids. Um, it may not always be what we want to hear, but we do learn from you as well. And so bravo to all of you. You spoke so well, and you spoke from the heart. Um, I have to give a special shout out to, to McKenna and to Den, um, who will be on stage next week in the Grinch. Um, and I'm sure that all of you, how many of you are involved in extracurricular activities in the community and, you know, outside of school? Um, and that doesn't surprise me um, because you just seem like such a, a well-rounded um, group of kids so and that's wonderful that you got 408 maybe next year it'll be 500 thank you <laughs> thank you to uh, the principals and the teachers as well yeah that was wonderful I'd like to go home now yes <laughs> trusty Paul um, I would like to thank first of all the opportunity that was given to you to come to the middle school conference to your to your teachers and to your administrators in your building what a wonderful way to um, gratify your teachers to hear you guys present like that to see the evidence I'm sure they see it every day but what a summative way for you to be able to communicate your learning back to them and help them understand how you are better um, I just love I just love what you guys just did it was just great I always try to take notes when students present and I don't aspire to remembering everything that everybody says, but I'm a write things down and read it again person. And so I wrote down some notes as you guys were all talking. And usually I pick one thing that I'm going to take home at least and focus on it. And the thing that really resonated with me today that was said, and that's more with Morgan, where are you? There you are. I think that it's an amazing message to come from your generation the message that you got from the first teacher you talked about that said don't waste a minute on technology that you could have spent on a relationship or an interaction with a person and that's a good reminder to us as adults too as we model for you as students we're always complaining about kids being on their technology too much and not talking to each other but part of our learning in the technology world has been that we do it too and so we need to be better role models but I love phrasing it in a way that we're just not saying don't use technology too much, but we're saying focus on the relationships and don't let technology waste relationship opportunity. So thank you, Morgan, for that piece of wisdom. That's what I'm taking home tonight. And I'm going to remember that. I wrote it down. And you are all awesome. And thanks so much for sharing with us. Any others? So it's interesting. We, uh, we're starting to talk about different different forms of data we collect to, to make decisions. And there's survey data, and I can't remember what that one's called, and then there's the next level of data. Then, we're then the, the, the third level of data is, is called street level data. And that's where we talk to students or people who we are directly affecting. And this is a perfect example of that, isn't it? Yes, you know, yes. uh, I mean, we, you know, you can't help but listen to what you s are saying here and, and do some things differently. So thank you for the, the great words. Um, Thank you, th thank you to uh, Principal Levings and Vice Principal Cochran for taking the lead in the conference. Thank you to all your colleagues, your admin colleagues who were a big part of it as well. And thank you to the Reimer teachers for the work you uh, did with, the, the, with these fine folks. So uh, we really appreciate it and words well spoken by you. And as a thank you, we have a small thank you gift for the students, which would be my pleasure to to vote to you, and I'm not, I'm just going to do it very quickly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we had all the schools represented in, uh, all right, oh, thank you, so welcome.
even one left over in case. All right. So um, with that, we'll say thank you, but I'm sure you're not going to want to stay around for the rest of this meeting. You have lots of things to do. Thank you, parents who helped for the, with the driving. Both and nodding pretty quickly. Can't go with them? Absolutely. Yes, you sure can. They can't I can't go with you guys. Good job, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I have them on Thank my you guys. Ride. I know. You See you tomorrow. I know you do. See you tomorrow. Careful. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? <laughs> yeah, good call, right? Huh. As soon as I heard it, I said that. Yeah, give you another well, reason. And there's a to learn something. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the second group answered the first group. And that's that's quite yeah, appropriate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's nothing to do with you. <laughs> the room didn't empty because you were coming up. All right, don't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> this happens to us all the time. <laughs> well, we have many reasons to be proud of our district. We saw one, and uh, and a second. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Secretary Treasurer Velastak to introduce this delegation or celebration, whichever we wish to call it. All right. Uh, yeah, Tanya Ty is our senior manager of occupational health and safety, uh, and she is here to talk uh, about a recent award the district won and. I, I think we won a similar award last year, maybe the year before as well. So uh, this is her area, so I'm going to turn it right over to her. Thanks, Ray. So it's my happy task today to present uh, the board with the Abbotsford School District's uh, NEOSH Week Award for 2019. Um, it is the district's uh, fourth award of this type that was presented at the CSSC. Uh, NAOSH uh, Week Safety Forum, which um, uh, Trustee Peterson attended with us this year. Um, the district was honored by this award um, by the NAOSH Week Steering Committee, specifically for its efforts in uh, occupational health and safety. Some of the efforts this year that were highlighted were had to do with safety week. Safety week is a really tough week in uh, the K-12 education sector because it comes at our very busiest time of year, it's in May, so it's a hard thing to get done. But a particular safety committee um, sort of decided to make it their thing. Our Center for uh, Resource and Education, a course site, their safety committee doubled in size this year. They took it on as a team building activity. Many of our safety committees have gone in that direction. Um, and basically, they just made um, safety their thing at the site. They did drill blitzes throughout safety week. Every week, every time I pulled it, it was a fire alarm or doing a lockdown drill. It was hard to have a meeting there, actually. <laughs> but they just got really excited about safety, and I think that caught the steering committee's attention. Um, as well, they also uh, created, a, with a new learning management system, online site orientation for all people who work at our core center um, and so they're really uh, committed to just making all the improvements they can in health and safety. Yay. Well I'm going to just say thank you to you and your team for the great work you're doing. I mean uh, we bask in your in you know in in the work that you find work that you do. Uh, I would just like to say uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to go uh, to this award for a few years uh, in a row uh, prior to now, and it has been an amazing experience getting to know how much work is done by your committee of people and the stuff that the rest of us never think of that you guys do behind the scenes to make sure that our staff and our students are, are safe in the district. And uh, the level of commitment and excellence that you guys bring to the district um, the binder, it's onerous to get through. <laughs> I've walked through it a couple of times now. and Some of it looks tedious, but somebody took the time to think about the implication of that particular item and how it could save somebody their health or their safety. And uh, again, the attention to detail. And uh, we were just talking about this before the meeting that people 
uh, that do the work that you do are kind of the unsung heroes. And it's probably hard to be popular uh, in a place where you're constantly the one that you feel like your big brother, hey, you should be doing that. And can you make sure this, you know, that's not the right process for that? And you're in an oversight position that might make you unpopular. And yet you're not, Tanya. The, the quality of service that you bring, the staff knows that you're there looking out for them. And it's just really awesome for us to know that we just have such excellent people representing us. And we just thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. In any case, uh, I want to say congratulations to the board and to the Abbotsford School District because really um, it is your uh, support of everything we do in workplace safety that makes uh, honors like this really possible. All right. Great. It's good to hear. Thank you. It's great to hear. And we have a third delegation. We have a parent from King Traditional, uh, Ms. S. Gaudet, who's going to speak to us about air quality, and I'm assuming you have some some parent support with you, yeah, and thank you, thank, thank you for being here. And uh, I'm going to ask you please to keep your comments to 10 minutes. Oh yeah, I'll uh, be under that for and sure. And with the understanding that uh, it's not our protocol to respond to your presentation, all right, but rather to receive it. Yeah. Uh, pardon me. We do have question. We period. do have a question period. Yes, where but that comes after the fact. Okay, and you'll note too that. Actually, as one of our agenda items is to be speaking to the very issue you're talking to. Yes, I understand uh, time is going to be on that. Yes. On that later. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at your meeting tonight. I really appreciate that. As you said, my name is Shannon Gaudet, and I'm here representing parents from King Traditional Town who continue to be very concerned about our children's health and wellness while at school. As you are all well aware, since the spring of 2017, the teachers, students, and staff of King Elementary have been dealing with a very, con very concerning side effects as a result of a toxic smell coming from the property at 1582 Bradner Road. Coincidentally, this is when 93 Land Company purchased the property. The initial concerns from that spring were reported to the school district by the school administrator, who then reported the concerns to City Hall and to the district and the environment ministry and agriculture ministry. Following up on the concerns, staff from the Ministry of Environment conducted an inspection of the property in, 2000, in October 2017, which resulted in the owner of 93 Land Company receiving an advisory of non-compliance for violations of the Environmental Management Act related to the importation of manure for non-farm use and improper storage practices. For those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of experiencing the toxic smell at King Traditional, an odor that continues to permeate King's school grounds and buildings, it is far from being a regular Abbotsford farm smell. I personally have been around farms my entire life, farms of all kinds, for most of my life, and as have a large percentage of the King parents, some of whom still have farms of their own. But none of us have ever experienced a smell as bad as this. It is a smell that has resulted in students, teachers, and staff dealing with serious health issues, vomiting at school, not feeling nauseous at school, dizziness, headaches, and respiratory issues. Students are consistently feeling unwell, getting sick to their stomach, having stomach aches, headaches, not wanting to eat their lunch, and covering their faces with their coats and sweaters when outside and have dealing with respiratory, ongoing respiratory issues. The same is being reported by the teachers, of which several have made WorkSave claims. I took it upon myself to do some research on the gases that are produced by a manure storage facility, like the one across the street from the school, to see if there was any connections regarding side effects from the gases and what the teachers and the students were experiencing. So I discovered on a very reputable website called nasdonline.org that the gases produced from a manure storage facility are hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia, which if inhaled even low doses can result in headaches, nausea, dizziness, and respiratory issues, all of which students, teachers, and staff have been experiencing and continue to experience. Many staff steps have been taken to address these concerns, including including a 300 signature petition done by parents at the beginning of 2018. It was sent out to the Minister of Health, the Minister of Environment, Mayor Braun and Council, school district staff. The facility as stated by George Hyman, the Minister of Environment was, 
it was an un, it is an unauthorized illegal operation. In the spring of 2018, the school district contracted an independent company to conduct air quality testing and install carbon air filters in the vents at the school. Unfortunately, as the air testing occurred on an okay day, the results weren't accurate to what they would be on a bad day. And the air filters, although they initially helped with the concerns inside the school, they did nothing to address the concerns when teachers, staff, and students were outside for recess, lunch, gym, soccer practice, track and field, and kilometer club. The facility operation received their first official warning of non-compliance after a second inspection in February of 2018. However, despite the warning, the toxic smell continued, as did the health concerns for our kids. Thanks to the direction from the staff from the Ministry of Environment, parents started reporting their concerns regarding the smell to the Ministry's RAP line, reporting all poachers and polluters. As a result, a third inspection in June of 2018 resulted in a second official warning of non-compliance, and a fourth inspection in November 2018 resulted in a third warning of non-compliance, as well as a significant monetary penalty, which the company probably, promptly paid. And this brings us to where we are today. Although the smell was significantly better at the, after the company received their fourth warning and monetary penalty, this year the smell is back, as toxic as ever. The concern for the health and wellness of the students, teachers, and staff at King is higher than ever. I'm in regular contact with staff from the Ministry of Environment, and parents continue to call the RAP line with their concerns, and now thanks to the staff at the Ministry, parents <coughs> have also contacted the owner of 93 Land Company, who lives up in Armstrong, and his operations manager directly. The story has been recently reported by Abbotsford News on two occasions, as well as on CBC Radio, their evening news, and on their social media. I sent a letter out on October 25th to Mayor Braun and Council, MLA Dara Plekis, school district staff, the Minister of Environment, and to all of you. The response, other than from Mayor Braun, was very disheartening. 93 Land Company is well aware of the negative effects their operation is having on the students and teachers of King Traditional, but they just don't seem to care. They obviously care more about making money with their illegal, unauthorized operation than doing what is right and ethical. In addition, as a representative of the parents of King Traditional, I wanted to express the need for us to feel fully supported by our school administrator, the school district, and our elected board of trustees in our efforts to effect change with this issue. We hope that moving forward, we can be actively supported by all of you with a strong united voice and with the best interests of our children in mind, do what is ethically right and work to get 93 Land Company's operation shut down until they're in compliance. For the health and wellness of the te teachers, students, and staff at King, this needs to happen. We love our children, we love our teachers, and we love our school, and we need your support. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, for providing a, a call. Thank you very much. And well done. So, um, as, you, as I said, you'll see that we're going to be discussing the issue as an agenda item uh, coming up, so I would encourage you to stick around for that. Uh, before that time, we have some educational reports. And the first one is from our Information and Technology Department and discussion around strategic plan progress. Okay, so I, um, under the, uh, the, the pillar of engaging opportunities, of course, as the board knows, we have a uh, goal to improve the district's IT security. Our uh, director of, of IT is here, Mr. O'Brien, welcome. I'll turn it over to you to present your report. Thanks. Um, so, uh, still, oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, just a really quick overview of our technology. Um, as you can see, we've got uh, almost 14,000 uh, total endpoints in our district, which we uh, can all control and have to secure to, to various degrees. Um, 18,000 emails per week, that's just an average. It obviously goes up and down. Uh, Two million documents stored, that number is actually going up significantly all the time. 
the majority of our storage now is in two cloud locations, um, Microsoft Azure and uh, uh, Google Docs. And we're seeing a large increase in our, in our cloud-based uh, storage as well, too. Oops, sorry. Um, so overall, uh, improved district's IT security. Uh, one of the ways we're doing this, uh, we're targeting uh, the number of compromised staff and user accounts. When I say compromised accounts, I mean um, people's accounts that have been compromised because they've clicked on malware or clickbait. It's the most common uh, method of, of gaining, uh, gaining access to people's email information, uh, as well as, uh, to a lesser extent, um, uh, some social engineering. Uh, this year alone, I think we've had uh, two people who have, who have spent over $1,000 of their own money uh, purchasing gift cards to, uh, to, to people who they think are actually part of the IT department and, and they're not, uh, sad to say. So uh, that number is actually low considering the amount of staff we have. However, the fact that people are still falling for this issue means we have to continue our education of, of in cybersecurity threats of, of all kinds. Uh, we did have a 50%, uh, our target was a 40% reduction, we did have a 50% uh, reduction after the Wombat training that we did, and I'm really happy to say that in the first half of this year, we've only had, I think, 13 or 14 compromised accounts, so that's a significant reduction, and uh, we're hoping to, uh, to reduce that still. We're seeing a little bit of an uptake uh, in the early part of the year because we do have a bunch of new staff that have not taken the Wombat training, but going forward, that's actually going to be part of the, uh, the onboarding uh, in correlation with, with HR. Uh, continuous security improvement strategy. We just, um, as many of you know, we work with the uh, Ministry of Education for the uh, cybersecurity pro um, projects, and we just completed phase two which is called the CES uh, Enhanced Cybersecurity. And uh, we've basically hardened our firewall rules even more, but more importantly, we're, we're using uh, user identification and application identification techniques. And basically, that's a really fancy way of saying we, we look into the application level detail of what people are using, and we have lists of, of applications that are safe and applications that are not, and that helps people from launching applications that they shouldn't be launching. So it's, it's, it's uh, really helped make a significant difference. We're also starting to use user identification um, uh, ID tactics, uh, including uh, Microsoft has made a lot of really significant advances right now in, in security for their um, Active Directory in the cloud. And some of the things that we're doing it are um, we're using geolocation-based logins. So if you log in to your computer here in Abbotsford and five minutes later you log in from China, it won't allow that, that second login. And we actually see a significant amount of that, surprisingly. So wow. that, uh, it's, it's things like that that, that really help uh, protect us, as well as uh, using two-factor authentication for all of the uh, senior administration right now. So. Uh, you not only have to have a password, but you have to have a basically a, a ID tag that comes on your cell phone or or uh, laptop that you use to to gain authentication. That way, it makes it harder. Even if somebody just has your, if they get your password, they need that second piece. So it's just one level of security. And uh, we're continuing on with um, uh, numerous uh, uh, new new initiatives that Microsoft is coming out as well as the uh, the NGN uh, rules for our firewall. Um, end user training and communication to reduce triggering of cyber th security threats. So again, this goes back to our Wombat training. We did see a significant reduction. We had over, I think we had 81% completion rate for all staff, which is, is really fantastic. The industry average is between 50 and 65%. So I was really happy to see that uh, we've got a lot of staff um, engaging with that training. And we had an average score of 85%, which is also very good. Uh, this year, we're going to uh, 
be implementing a uh, training module for all the senior uh, management, which it's um, it's designed to to find out where our biggest holes are in terms of uh, in terms of knowledge. We want to make sure that senior management has the highest level of training because obviously they have access to, to the <coughs> sort of data in the schools, and that includes uh, principals and vice principals as well that uh, have more access to uh, students' privacy information as well. Uh, we'll be launching that uh, actually shortly in the next couple of weeks. Um, live cybersecurity, important. You guys all read the news. You've seen that, especially in the United States, this year especially, we've seen a significant increase in K-12 schools being hit. Uh, the past few years, most of the education side attacks have been for higher education because they have, uh, they have more money, more ability to pay. But what we're seeing is with the um, ease that these attacks can be purchased online now by people that don't have a lot of technical ability, they're actually going for smaller, they're looking at making smaller amounts of money over a larger scale. So we've had, there's been three or four districts in the U.S. that were actually unable to open their schools in September because of ransomware attacks. And just recently, actually this morning, I got um, a feed that uh, three ransomware attacks have been launched against school districts in Ontario, and right now they're actually shut down. So unfortunately, we are going to see more and more of these kind of attacks against our organization. And that's why we just have to be constantly vigilant, vigilant and constantly uh, increasing our, our skill sets uh, to, to, to fight these bad actors. Um, so some of the threats and countermeasures we're using, uh, lack of cybersecurity, threat awareness amongst staff. Uh, again, going back, we're doing our Wombat security assessment um, this year. And that's going to access to um, allow us to target weak areas um, for training. Um, bad actors using compromised network credentials to access internal systems. These are the Microsoft uh, measures that I was talking about: um, conditional access, multi-factor authentication, and role-based access rules. So, role-based access meaning that you get access to things that apply to your job. If they don't apply to your job, you can't access them. That just kind of limits the attack surface of our, of our staff. Um, securing our, one of the biggest holes that we still have now is uh, our, all of our HVAC equipment in the facility side. It's um, like, like most businesses, it, it's old. You buy it once and you kind of keep it forever sort of thing. Uh, the downside is that it was never designed to have any security at all. Matter of fact, I think most of the passwords have a maximum of three digits per <laughs> password. So, you know, you can sit there and guess that pretty quickly just, just pressing a keypad. So we've purchased um, this new equipment that basically segregates all of those HVAC devices that are in every school, every site actually in the district. And uh, that's going to go a long way to uh, to securing that that uh, one area, and that includes things like security cameras and IoT devices that we're seeing a, a significant increase at, at sites as well. Too. So I'm really happy that we're doing that. Um, questions? Trustee Anderson. In your report for targets, before I get back to the other. 9.22 and 9.24, it says on target and on target, and I wanted to know what the targets were. Uh, what's 9 point? Reduce the user frequency of triggering malware, phishing and spamming. This, this is the strategies. Right, so that, that goes back to the number of people that have compromised accounts. So it was a 50% reduction. We show that reduction actually at the, I think it's at the 9.2 level. So it's, it's the same measure, is what I'm saying. Okay. Okay, because it, it just says you're on target, but it doesn't say what your target was. So the, we used, the number that we used was uh, last year we had 87 uh, compromised accounts, and that's now, that by the end of that year, is down to 40, 42 or 43. And so it was a 50% reduction. And that'll be an ongoing 
uh, there'll be an ongoing number because as we get new staff, we have to keep them trained and and uh, educated and into not clicking on that kind of stuff. And, and just to follow up, some of the on targets are referring to the project that, that is being implemented, whether it's been Wombat to to, implement, to to do some of the cybersecurity training or whether it's been uh, improvements to firewall hardening. So that's what it's referring to in the three-digit strategy. Yeah. It's referring to some of the, those strategies that have been completed and as opposed to the measures up above at the two-digit where we specifically measure something. Yes. We're not measuring anything other than... Are we have we implemented the project and are we completing the project uh, type of thing? And some of these are, are ongoing projects. They'll essentially like the the improvements on um, on the role based authentic. Uh, uh, sorry, the security of authentication and that kind of stuff. It's it's not something that's ever going to stop because there's always new technologies and new threats that we have to try and match those. So. Uh, it, it's hard to put a, a number target on that because it. It'll just it'll never be ending. Only, never it'll be never ending. <laughs> well, hopefully there'll be a day that it's never end that it'll end. But okay, I, I, I oh, okay. Oh, more. another question. Yes, um, wombat. I enjoyed taking that. Great. But I would like to have a refresher, something in front of me that I can go through, and say, okay, what do I keep lo looking at? Not not just. We take it and the thing disappears. Is there something that's down, like a little booklet or something that we could, we can access for it? Uh, not specifically on Wombat. We don't have any. We don't have any printed material for Wombat. It's designed to be online. However, there's lots of online references that you can download. Um, but but specifically for Wombat, we we should continually mm -hmm. uh, to take it, and we will be uh, launching more campaigns. And, um, and again, as part of the staff onboarding progr uh, program, new staff will have to take, um, take the training. But you're absolutely right. You can't, it's not just a one and done kind of thing. We need to constantly refresh our memories because, I mean, even I sometimes forget stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's constant learning. Um, and, and we will eventually open up those um, older modules for everybody to, to retake if you want, for sure. Jesse Pauls? Um, I wanted to say thank you, first of all, for making us do what you did because I've had many, aha, I recognize this and not done it because of the training like Trustee Anderson said, so I appreciate it very much. You mentioned a number that we're at 81% compliance of our staff taking it. What are we doing to encourage the other 19%? So the, the nice part is the, the larger part of those people that didn't take it were actually TOCs. And it's very difficult, especially for the ones that are only here for a day or half a day. It was uh, very challenging for the principals and vice principals to have those staff take it. So we're working with HR to figure out uh, ways that we can get that um, training out to them. If you take away the TOCs, which we haven't actually looked at the numbers yet, it's probably closer to 90, 95%. Wow. Uh, however, there are still people that aren't taking it, and um, we're, we're going to gently prod them by the end of the year to, to complete it. Thank you. Yes, just yeah, I just want to thank you for the Wombat training, too. It's helped me at my work and at home. Anytime I open my device, it's, it's really helpful. That's to great. recognize because you don't you don't know what you're looking for until you know what you're looking for. Exactly. We're getting a lot of feedback from the teachers as well too. Despite that they maybe weren't all happy about mm -hmm. having to take it, once they take it, once they took it, many of them did say that it was really useful. Yeah. Um, so if there's any more if there's uh, not any more questions. Yeah, one, one I just wanted here. to say I would just remind the board that last year in your budget, uh, this whole area and so much in technology is becoming so specialized. And this whole area in IT security uh, and privacy is such a specialized area now. You used to be able to have somebody, you know, one person that could manage four or five different uh, components related to security. And now it has become the industry standards specialization in so many of these areas because it's so technical. And so I just I wanted to remind you and thank, and on behalf of Carmen, for the security position that we were able to fill last year uh, or this year uh, in his department. So that fills a big hole. And, you know, when you hear about districts getting hit all the time, the ones that make the news uh, are particularly noticeable, but it's the ones that don't ever make mm -hmm. the news. And there are, are many, many that, that we hear about uh, that, that aren't in the public 
of view that, that have, have to deal with these. We had one three or four years ago, if you recall, that took our email systems right offline uh, for a week. And I mean, at the end of the day, it all worked out, but it was a, it was a stressful week of, of investigation. And yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, to end with I with I, I think is a really funny video in that in relate that's very related to what uh, that what we're talking about here. Okay. Yo, man. Hello. Can you help me, man? Sure. How can I help you? My account just got wiped. You must be joking. I don't know how I let this happen. By who? Some guy pretending to be you. You know. Mm. Man, I don't know what to do. It wasn't me. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. okay. oh. Move to receive, I guess? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> that's right. Uh, we have a motion. So, Trustee Newfeld. Second. Trustee Rye. <laughs> I'll only approve it if he sends that video to us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to I was gonna say it in jest, but we get 18,000 emails a week. I wonder who gets the other one. I get 17,999. <laughs> I'm sure we all feel about the same, right? Yeah. All right, we, we have a second. Yeah, okay, we're going to top that. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another, another, another one of our pillars, of course, and, and a really significant one is the kind of the board strategic plan as a progressive workforce. Uh, in there, uh, their goals related to uh, in, uh, improve employee retention and recruitment health and safety, our leadership, <coughs> and our excellence in teaching. Today, we're just going to focus around uh, recruitment and uh, uh, health and well-being and a little bit on leadership. So I'm going to uh, welcome Associate Superintendent Michelle Radomsky for your report. Thank you. Um, I also have a video. It's going to be more heartwarming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll start off with one of our key objectives of our progressive workforce strategy. The first one is uh, to increase employee performance and engagement. Um, we have measured engagement biannually through the thought exchange, and so we're currently working with communications to confirm the timing and approach that we're going to take to our next outreach to employees. The other uh, key measure is with regards to retention, and that is employee turnover. So this rate uh, in front of you is based on headcount and exits of regular employees. Uh, this figure focuses on teachers and support staff to reflect the focus of our recruitment efforts. Um, as I mentioned last time I presented, some level of turnover is considered healthy for an organization and our turnover rates continue to be well within industry averages. Uh, we can see an increase from last school year and this can be attributed to continuing movement between districts as well um, as double the number of retirements in the teacher portfolio. So that's something we're continuing to monitor. An operational metric that helps fill out the picture of our workforce is the number of external hires. So this data represents recruitment to both regular and casual positions. There are a couple of items to note when it comes to external recruitment. 
In the teacher portfolio, we can see a slight decrease from last year. One of the primary reasons for this is the shift in timing, the duration of the Bachelor of Education program at Southern Fraser University. So they would have graduated typically in May. Their graduation uh, occurred this year in November, so that is demonstrated in the stats there. Um, and I think it also reflects the dedicated effort last year on uh, recruiting French immersion teachers. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of attention paid to that. Yeah. Another night item to note uh, is the increase in recruitment in the support portfolio compared to the previous year. And this reflects the onboarding of crossing guards as employees, as well as increased capacity in the HR team when we return to full complement. So that was great. Our primary challenge in recruitment continues to be maintaining and growing our casual pools. What we're finding is it's a real balancing act in terms of retaining people who are waiting for full-time positions to become available, as well as retaining people who don't want to work full-time and want flexibility. So it's we're in this very mm. interesting tension. Uh, we're changing demo demographics. So in order to address our recruitment needs, we continue to attend job fairs throughout BC and Canada. We're also introducing innovations to our recruitment and selection process. For example, we're piloting new software that enables a virtual interview process with video for remote candidates. We're updating our website with communications to enable candidates to set up uh, job posting notifications. We continue to cultivate partnerships with post-secondary institutions. We think this is really key, especially hosting practical students. And just so far this year, we've established uh, partnerships with Vancouver Island University and the University of Northern BC in addition to already our existing partnerships with more local uh, post-secondary institutions. Um, an area of key focus last year and continues this year is enhancements to orientation and onboarding. So last year we worked with Learning Support Services and we designed and implemented an orientation session for education assistants. This year we've now broadened that orientation session to be um, relevant for all support staff and we provide it on a monthly basis. We also have launched an onboarding survey that follows that orientation session to find out feedback about the session, but also their ideas about what would enhance their onboarding experience. We've updated our teacher information sessions and delivered those more frequently as well. And this year we're introducing something new. Uh, we are establishing a social connection group for teachers who have joined us from outside the Lower Mainland so that they can build connections in the organization and in the community. And the first get together is actually tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. We continue to look at opportunities to support employees' professional development. We know that it's something that candidates look for as well as demonstrates how we value employees and just demonstrates our overarching commitment to learning. Last year we had an annual shared learning conference for two days. The, um, the figure that you see in OnStrategy also represents the e-learning provided on cybersecurity to all employees by IT. And in 2020, we will be rolling out respectful workplace learning for all employees. We also defined uh, education assistant proficiencies last year via um, focus groups, and we've expanded that now to reflect uh, all instructional support positions, and we'll be rolling those out in 2020. Um, a milestone in terms of addressing a key barrier to employee engagement in the support portfolio has been the work we completed with Teamsters Local 31 on how jobs are evaluated and compensated. We've made a very significant first step in that work, and work will continue both locally and provincially. And finally, in uh, April of 2019, the HR team designed and launched an exit survey to gather information about why people leave the district. Um, the sample size is still quite small. Uh, so far, respondents have primarily been support staff. They've indicated higher pay and better opportunities as the top reasons for their departure. On a really positive note, though, 85% of respondents would recommend working at the Abbotsford School District. I think that's a really telling stat. I'm going to touch briefly on growth plans as well. So in February 2018, the growth plan pilot was signed off with um, the ATU, and an online system was implemented uh, for teachers to input their growth plans and teacher evaluations. Last year, to enable our leaders and teachers in this area, we made system improvements, and we designed and delivered training sessions and resources. And you can see here from the data that the vast majority of teachers and their leaders chose to develop a growth plan rather than complete a teacher evaluation. The survey is currently in process to gather feedback on the growth plan process to inform our future efforts. Uh, so far we have 102 respondents to that survey and results are very positive. Just a couple of examples. 92% of respondents agree that their practice has improved as a result of their growth plan. 
94 respondent, 94 uh, percent of respondents would choose to do another growth plan rather than return to a teacher evaluation. So we're really pleased with the results so far. Um, we're also conducting a review of software options because you can see this is a key area of improvement. That's also getting validated in the survey, uh, with only half of survey respondents indicating that the system was user friendly. So based on the success of the growth plan process, we're really hoping that we can continue this option for teachers. And as Kevin mentioned, I'm going to touch a little bit on leadership development as well and talk about some of the initiatives we have in place. So in the past year, we've drafted leadership competencies that will guide our recruitment and selection and inform our leadership development efforts. The competencies have been designed to highlight the role that leadership plays in achieving our district strategies and building a strong culture. They reflect our curriculum and our commitment to equity. Uh, the draft has been presented to our leaders for review and we're currently just refining them at this point. We have a number of leadership programs established and they address the range of leadership roles in the district. We have academies for teacher leaders, vice principals, and assistant leadership. They take a collaborative networking approach and provide opportunities to learn from different leaders and departments in the organization. The goal is to increase the understanding of the organization and system as a whole in order to enhance leaders' thinking and what they bring both to their current role as well as pre prepare them for their progression. We also provide mentorship and coaching for, to current leaders to facilitate their ongoing learning. Mentors and coaches act as thought partners and create space for leaders to reflect, plan, apply their knowledge and skills, and learn from their experiences in leading their school and specifically around leading change. And all of these components come together to form our leadership development framework to attract, retain, and support leaders throughout their career. And finally, uh, moving on to organizational health. Our key measure for organizational health is employee absences, which increased slightly from 2017-18. While the absence rate remains aligned with industry averages that you see there, we do want to continue to improve as an organization, and therefore this metric is, continues to be off target. Uh, we are building on some areas of strength. Last uh, In February, I spoke about our Josh committees and the increase in membership and the training that they've completed. You've heard from Tanya about the continued recognition of the work we do in health and safety uh, by NAOSH. In 2019, we have three primary areas of focus. One is the attendance support program. This year, we adjusted our attendance support cycle so that the timing of these conversations is more considerate of what's going on in schools. So for example, um, it used to take, those conversations used to take place in January and May. We shifted that to October and February when we know that leaders can have more meaningful conversations with their employees. We're also working on claims management. We know that when people stay connected to the organization when they're on leave, it helps their recovery and their return to work. And the HR team is currently reviewing roles and responsibilities, our processes and the resources that we have to support this. And we're updating site-based and organizational violence risk assessments. To date, we've been very responsive to specific situations and needs, and a broader risk assessment will enable us to address needs at a system level. Our next step is to pilot an online risk assessment template at specific schools beginning in January. So I, I'm going to close with a video, but just in terms of closing comments, um, I just want to speak to the work that the HR team is doing together. We see a lot of opportunity to enhance our employees' experience. And while that means a lot of work ahead, we're very excited about it. And we've now gotten into this great rhythm of analyzing data, reviewing our systems and processes, asking why, checking in with our stakeholders, and exploring and experimenting with different ways of doing things. So it's a really great time in the department, and we think it's going to make a big difference in the organization. And so to close, I want to share a little bit of the inspiration behind our work and uh, present the video that Kayla helped us develop that shares some of the employee testimonials we've gathered. And there's a couple of videos developed. This one in particular focuses on support staff and operations management. I see a question first. Do you want to have questions Nichols? first yeah. or do you want to have the video first? Your call. Can I? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have, first of all, thank you for all the work you do. I mean, it's not easy um, hurting a whole district full of different expectations. Uh, employee absentees and the targets off. Um, I have some my ideas, but I just want to know, what, what are the contributing factors? Um, so it, it, I think that varies by portfolio. Um, I think that we're looking at, um, so I'm going to start with the support portfolio. Uh, I think the workplace is more complex than it used to be. 
And so I think that's testing people's resilience. That would apply to, I think, everyone in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's a common theme, not just in education, but everywhere. Um, I think that um, we have, and actually I'm looking kind of channeling Tanya here, right? Because she has much more kind of specific insight in terms of the duration of our leaves and that thing. I do think there's an opportunity for HR to be more rigorous, rigorously monitoring why people are off, how long they're off, and staying connected. So I actually do think that's part of the reason is that maybe we haven't stayed as connected to people when they're off as we could. Okay. Yeah. Can I just throw two things out just in the back of my mind and I'll ask the question. Uh, is it maybe some of the expectations of millennial teachers and how they use absentees versus the older te uh, seasoned teachers that don't use them as much? Uh, my experience is that um, different generations may want different flexibility, but that doesn't always reflect in absences. That, okay. that actually okay. reflects more in, in their um, their expectations around scheduling, and they're a bit more proactive about it, actually. Okay. The other one is, do you see, I want to be careful how I say it, but I'm just going to say it because I can. Um, do you see a difference in a year where it's a bargaining year than you do other years? Um, this year has been challenging, especially um, in the support portfolio. It's hard to pinpoint why. Why? Yeah. But we have noticed that the volume of absences happened sooner this year than it did in previous years. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Cross. Before I ask my question, Michelle, I also want to say the same thing to you that I said to Tanya. In a time, as Trustee Newfeld has already pointed out, that when we're in bargaining, people tend to focus on what the parties don't do for each other. And again, the work that HR does in health and wellness and support of staff and programming and follow-up and the acknowledgement that we need to stay more connected to our employees when they're not with us all needs to be celebrated that this is how we care for our employees regardless of what's going on in the media world or the contract world that may or about our employees and looking after them so thank you for all of your care and attention to that um, something you said earlier and trustee newfeld touched on this we talked about the flexibility piece with the changing demographic and he identified them as the millennial group most likely and we, we know that not wanting to take on a full-time position or a 1.0 is a challenge for us. We went through uh, a few years ago, we were great proponents of job shares so that the, the returning to work moms that could take the you know, 0.6 and a 0.4 and you'd have two teachers. And there was a, an onerous cost to the district in benefits to employ so many more people to fill a 1.0. And it wasn't cost effective, although that's pragmatic. It doesn't help us with flexibility. Can you talk to us a little bit about what kind of solutions we have to our flexibility issues without it running into a cost that we can't afford, but still being able to meet the needs of the changing demographics so that we can retain those people that don't want the 1.0 because we really need them? Yeah. Um, yeah, we do. <laughs> um, I think there are some creative strategy. I mean, if you're looking at it from a cost perspective, then it's about are people willing and able to take casual positions and just be committed to, to a certain availability. The other thing we're balancing is actually continuity for students. And so mm, um, yeah. that's actually one that's of the biggest one. struggle in the support portfolio because just conceptually we wouldn't have any issue with supporting people's flexibility. But how, when and how does that impact the students and how do you mitigate mm. that? Mm. So that's been our, our dilemma. Because um, I think if, if, you, if people are comfortable staying in the casual pool in order to get the flexibility, then you don't have the same cost implications. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, and then I think from a cost perspective, we also have to look at the, the lens of uh, when there are unfilled vacancies, what's the, both the direct cost savings, but also the cost to the school uh, on those days. So that, those are things that we'll probably have to get a little bit more analytical about. Thank you. Trustee Latham. <clears throat> so I've, I've written <coughs> down, I really like this idea of testing resilience because that's what I hear is I don't know when life got so complicated. Um, so <laughs> in the health and wellness um, end of things, and we know there's a focus on mental health for our kids, mm -hmm. but we have to focus on mental health for ourselves too. So um, probably through some of our workshops, we, do we have some workshops that people can take or... Suggestions that we give to staff members about yeah. 
I mean, we have the, mm -hmm. the, the foundational piece around our employee family assistance program, and we, we uh, communicate that very prominently. We also do work directly with the NIMI in many support mm -hmm. services around this, and so I would say we're in early stages, but we're Nathan and I are communicating around different mental health awareness and mental health first aid training for staff. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's coming. It's interesting because the HR team, we're talking about what strength we need this, this year for our communications and we chose resilience. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something that we're turning our attention to. Right. There, there is a shift, even at the BCSDA mm -hmm. um, conference. Um, Trustee Newfeld was talking about a couple of the speakers where we were laughing out loud but the message is about that you have to take care of yourself. You have to take time for yourself. And how do we do that in this world of technology and, yeah, all the family struggles and that sort of thing. So. There are a lot of demands for people both inside and outside. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, Thank and I you. Would, and I would just throw it, and, and just to that point, it was what the speaker was talking about. Um, we are doing a lot of training around self-regulation in the classroom. And lesson one in self-regulation is self-regulated kids are in classrooms with self-regulated teachers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work that we are doing now, there, it's still a smaller pilot, so your point that it's still early days. Uh, but that's what we're learning in those places where you actually deal with both the student and the teacher, it actually works well. So I, I, I think there's some lessons to be learned from that. Good. Very good. Okay. Trustee Anderson. Mm -hmm. For this 10.43 days employee, yes. um, financially, how does that add up? What What does it cost us like for a year in, in that area when they're off work? I actually didn't bring that with me. Um, so that will vary according to obviously the position. Yes. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm hesitant to do math on the spot. <laughs> uh, but I can definitely follow up with that. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Trustee Wilson. Um, Michelle, thank you, because as you know, I appreciate the work you do. Um, one of the questions I have is around um, any trends in the timelines of those absences. Like, do we see them connected to certain times? Yeah, we're just starting to dig into the data in a different way. Uh, we focused this year on kind of adjusting our cycles, and so that means we shift the data as well in terms of the lens that you're looking at. Uh, but that will be next, if just if there's certain patterns that we can see, and then those conversations can be different. And um, a, a number of years ago, we had a report, painful report, I think Trustee Newfield and Ryan might remember, but um, where they looked at the two-week spring break and whether that had made an impact on absences. Mm -hmm. And it actually showed that the absences moved from, it didn't reduce the number of absences, it just shifted them to a different part mm -hmm. of the year, yeah. later in the year. So it was an interesting read on that data. Okay. But that was, I can't remember what year that was, but... I'd be curious to yeah, see yeah, where some yeah. of that went. Mm -hmm. The summer of 2010. There you go. Something we're looking at wow. is whether That's Power good. School can That's start to support our data in this area. Can we open that up? Mm -hmm. And so if we can move some of our uh, health and safety information and have our needs met in Power School, we'll be able to run much more robust. Right now, there's a lot of complicated Excel spreadsheets we built. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. And we have a video. Yes, we do. <clears throat> That's right. A lot of times I can leave the district and head home feeling good because of the thank yous that I've gotten from people who have been appreciative of, of not just the big things that we do, but the little things. I love the people. I love connecting people to their passions. I love that I get to um, do a job offer and someone cries because they just love that position so much. You know, I can walk into school pretty much any principal will call me first name, hi, how's it going, and I can you know, do the same. And, and we've got a great rapport with you know, all this staff. I really feel that, uh, that I, am, I am part of, of the thing in the school. Yeah, and I love that. I love the kids, seeing the kids come in every day, especially my late ones, so that just come in. Good morning, Mrs. Come in. The parents that come in and just say thank you to me for being approachable and uh, being able to feel comfortable to come in with any concerns. I'm the first one they see in the morning, so if I can smile at them and, and they start off right, I, I feel like that, that conflict comes. It's great. We're always working in teams. Um, we all 
pick up on each other's strengths. So each employee has a unique skill set. And we work on that and we work together towards certain goals. Uh, the Abbotsford School District is leading edge when it comes to technology. Uh, so I, I love it. I, I get to play with the things that we do. <laughs> Uh, we're always looking to see what we can do to improve. We celebrate our successes. Uh, we know that we're a successful school district, uh, but we're not we're not comfortable with um, good enough. There's been a, a numerous times where we kind of wanted to try something, and it's it's been a wild idea that I've pitched to kind of our our superintendent and. Uh, Kevin's just like, run with it, let's see what happens. If it, if you can justify as to why it's valuable, then they certainly give you an option to kind of run with it. So we have a volunteer program called Project Connect. It's a great opportunity for people that aren't teachers or at the school sites to be able to go and connect with students in a way that they don't normally get paid to do. I don't know, just kind of make big nights, you know, why we're here and that we get to contribute to the front line as well. You know, we're allowed to be creative. In, in what we do here, um, it's never gone in thoughts, it's never squashed, it's never regimented. We have what's called a Bring Your Best program, and basically it's about supporting uh, employees in um, just achieving optimal health every day so that you can be engaged in the work that you love and you can be here and you can feel that you're at your best. I've stayed in Abbotsford uh, over this last 19 years because of the opportunities that the district has, has provided me with, not only in in, in job opportunities, but also in professional development. The district hosts uh, an annual shared learning conference, and there's something for everyone. If there's a particular area that I'm interested in, when professional development days come up, I can say, I'm really interested in this particular course or following this particular path. And uh, most of the time, if, if there's uh, something available, we can, we can have the opportunity to go and do that training. Well, I mean, our motto is come learn with us, and it definitely is that way. You, know, you want a learning opportunity where you're never stagnant, and you want a, a, you know, opportunity to grow and learn. It's here. You'll, you'll never stop learning. The, the work that's being done by the school district is it's important work, and it's um, people take great pride in it, and I think there's a just a level of, of professionalism that um, I certainly feel uh, with the people that I work with. It's a neat place to be, and it's a vibrant place to be, and I think that everyone should be lucky to work here. I enjoy my work, and the people who entrust me with this job. I would say accepting a job at the Abbotsford School District is probably one of the best decisions that I've made in my life, for sure. Wow. All right. We got so too. Is there a review coming up or something? <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Nenner, nenner. I think I think Mark O'Neill's going to trout for Vikings or something. Is he the yeah, there we go. That's yeah. it. Yeah. All right. So continuing in discussion uh, action. Oh, yes, action. Action. action item. I continue to forget that. All Second. right. Trustee Balls. Trustee Anderson. <coughs> and just from our reaction, I know what the vote's going to be. That's. Okay, continuing in the strategic uh, plan vein, uh, we, yeah, so, we now have a scorecard. Yeah, which is, yeah. so, think, uh, so this is, uh, we had some discussion uh, 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 during the course of last year with all of the presentations, like the two wonderful ones that you just had, and the two wonderful ones in the previous meeting, and the ones you're about to get in future meetings. Um, they, they, together, they tally and speak to the overall strategic direction of the board. And after a while, as time goes, especially as the budget cycle comes around and you have to make a decision, it's nice for you to be able to track uh, what was presented, what were some of the issues, uh, and uh, so that you're in a position to make some determination uh, for budget purposes. So the commitment that I made was to bring back a little summary sheet that could be, and I'll call it the scorecard, that you could use in connection with all of the goals that you see there. It identifies the person who's responsible, like the person who's making the presentation, the measures and targets that they have, the challenges and successes that they've identified, and then has a space uh, for you to consider what's the status, where are we, so that as we get into the budget cycle and you begin to make some determinations about where are areas that we're thriving, where are areas that growth is needed, we can actually look at this whole document 
uh, uh, in its entirety to say, okay, th th these are the spots that we, we should give some attention to. So this is the first cut of that. Part of the thought that we had would be to create a secure space for trustees to go have access to this. Now we will populate it, uh, but certainly you would have an opportunity to jot things in there if, if you wish, but we'll populate it after each one of the presentations so you get a sense of where we are. And then budget comes around, I think you'll have a complete document and we can have a fulsome conversation about really, which is a step back looking at the whole organization. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, right. any, any comments? It's good. All right. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. if, you know, we should take great pride in our, in our journey along the strategic plan. I don't know. Uh, what's the word? You should do a presentation at your next BCSDA. Well, we probably could, yes. Uh, and, and you, know <laughs> you could make big money. Yeah, there we go. All right. Okay, so here's a timely talk, topic. I know we've talked informally about our concern about student vaping, and, uh, and uh, uh, thanks to yeah. so <laughs> many, many things, we, we, we're addressing the issue. So yeah. I'll leave it and, to And so, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't go and reread re the report. Safe to say that we understand... Uh, I'll say internationally, uh, the whole issue of vaping is a very real one and no different uh, for Abbotsford than it is for Langley, than it is for Ontario, school districts in Ontario. Um, we, have, we have kind of, uh, I think, uh, you know, the public was kind of duped uh, is probably the best way I could put it by, 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 by uh, manufacturers of these products. and. Uh, I think have gone back in time with the amount of uh, nicotine that it's not just young people. Obviously, this is why the report is here, but it's everybody who is who is uh, vaping. So uh, there, there is there is no. I learned a long time ago. There is no simple solution to a complex problem. This has become a complex uh, issue, and and to me, uh, while we can certainly deal with it from a, a code of conduct standpoint, and we do have. Uh, procedures for dealing with it and as you can see there are students who are suspended for it that we are not going to suspend our way out of this issue I can guarantee you of that we're not going to suspend because this is an issue which reaches beyond <laughs> the school district and so while we may have kids make a discernment about what they do in schools versus not we're trying to educate them for life and so uh, one of the interesting ideas that recently came up with our senior team was uh, in the spirit of really what these young people were earlier were saying is that we really need to go and speak to the young people about this because we will need to enlist their support in A, understanding the problem and before B, trying to, proposing to respond to it. Uh, you might find some of the things they have to say, they're kind of surprising. Uh, I don't know, to me, some of it was. Um, uh, but uh, the plan that you see we have laid out there is to have a deeper engagement uh, with the kids so that we can discern the level one, two, and three kinds of response uh, that we have in the system to deal with this. This is going to take a while for us to, to fully uh, grasp it. And I think, you know, at some point a conversation needs to be had about, uh, I'll say, the provincial level and the, and the powers that be that make these products uh, I'll say as available as they are to, to kids, which is a, of grave concern to me. But I, I, I put this before you as a first step to us deeply investigating the issue before proposing to expand our intervention. Uh, and, and certainly we'll entertain any questions that you have at this point. Thank you, um, Superintendent Gordon. I know at uh, BCSTA this last weekend, uh, the Minister of Education talked about this very issue and said, uh, that the province is stepping in to start a more of a, a media blitz, yeah. and it's going to be student-run, which I think is absolutely important. But I also think it can't just be a provincial. I think it needs to all be, also be local, and I think that's why for us to do local. Um, a, a discussion was had at BCSTA about, um, like we did with tobacco, educating starting in early in school, the sooner we start that process, then by the time they reach middle school and high school, they will have that information in there. And I yeah. think that education has come a long way as far as, as far as cigarette smoking. And I think if we do the same thing with e-cigarettes, I think that'd be very, very important. That, that yeah. Those two things, yeah. student-led and then also education. Start those two early. Things, right? Start, Start early. early. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 
Trustee Wilson. Thank you, Chair Peterson. Um, the, a couple things. One, I firmly believe that this is a serious issue, um, and, but I also think it's not one that is just related to K to 12. I think it's like, it goes, it starts earlier and it ends much later. There have been adults who have um, spent time in the hospital because there's a bubble in their lung that they got from vaping. Um, so those things occurring, and you have conversations with um, paramedics, et cetera, about what they've seen. Um, I think it would actually probably also be in our interest to collaborate with the city on this particular mm. issue in uh, a broader community kind of um, awareness. Um, and what that looks like, I don't know, but it is a thought that crossed my mind. But I do have a question, um, and I always ask this question when I see this, but I can't help myself. Um, suspensions. They get caught and they get sent away from school. And, you know, then they have time off from school. They're not necessarily under any supervision in some cases. And, you know, we've had lots of discussions where we know that the in-school suspensions are better, the YMCA school, in-school suspension program, um, et cetera. So how many, how many out-of-school suspensions do we have and for how long are they? And are they really productive? Well, I think, you know, as a, as a district which has long been invested in restorative action, I mean, we, we have, as you know, dramatically dropped our suspension rates over the years. I don't actually have that information here. The numbers that you see there are a blend of in-school and out-of-school suspensions. It's just, it's what is recorded in the system. Uh, we've got a, a long-standing commitment to, to restorative action and to using in-school suspension, so I would be surprised if there are uh, the most of those are out of school I think most of them are in school and uh, I do know that uh, the majority of the out of school suspensions actually are uh, students who are referred to our alternative to, to suspension uh, program so that that's no different than than suspensions for smoking than for any other item of her for you know serious fighting or anything I mean those students are referred to our to our uh, alternative to suspension program Thank you. It's interesting. I look at one of the one of the some of the feedback from students, and one of the things the provincial government is doing is is not yeah, kids have to be a certain age to get flavors, flavored vape, make their own. And now I'm seeing here students make and sell their own vape juice. Yeah. So now I was they're, surprised. They're way, that I learned something there. I wait. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But, Trustee Latham, you had. Well, I'm just gonna. Um, Piggyback on to Trustee Wilson. She talked about you know talking to um, our city folks across the way, but I I think we also need to and I don't know when our next stakeholder meeting is, but I think we should be talking to our provincial politicians and having a discussion around this and what you know what is the government looking at in terms of um, different rules or you know, whatever. I mean, we can do all the education in the world, but we have to know that there are going to be rules in place and, you know, then somebody's got to make sure that they're going to be followed. Um, so, I mean, is there any way of preventing some of this stuff of getting into the hands of kids? I don't know. It seems to be everywhere. <clears throat> Trustee Wilson. Could we formally request our staff bring us back some way for us to communicate with the city, even the APD, like the police board, um, uh, even the university and the MLAs, I, I think just to, to, to create a plan to like a multi-pronged uh, approach with all of us. We all care and it's affecting, it's affecting those over 19 as well, mm -hmm. so. I might suggest that we have annually scheduled meetings with our MLAs and uh, uh, city council could be a topic of uh, discussion in the same way that the other items that you've discussed in the past to uh, to consider what what kind of action at that level uh, uh, might be appropriate. Uh, I, I, while I do agree that it's a broader issue, I think what we our mandate is K to twelve and staff and parents of K to twelve. So I think that's something we can control. And so I think the research that you're doing and you're trying to put some something together, I think once we have that, we'll see what that looks like and then have those discussions with whoever. So I just want to, um, 
in a nice way, counterpoint to um, Trustee Newfeld that um, I, I agree that it's our mandate in, in the K-12, but the K-12, our, our mandate through the Ministry of Education is actually cradle to grave. That's been repeated recently, and it still is. So if we can work, I think that implies that we should work with whomever we can. But we certainly, I do agree that our responsibility lies in the students in our care. Yeah. So balancing that out. Well, I, I, I agree with the superintendent. God, that it's complex, but it's it's great to see that we have taken what I think is a very proactive step, yeah, at least started yeah. that. So and I'll bring you back a, a, an updated and, report yeah. as to how this goes and, and how it might inform the actions that we're going to mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. um, going forward, for sure. That's so. what I agree. It'd be interesting to turn back the clock and see what school boards did to address the smoking issue, cigarette issue. I, you know, I, I mean, this is one and the same, but anyway. Okay. And um, uh, that's if everybody's okay with that. Okay, uh, the 2020 Community Matters Award um, for the public's uh, uh, information. Once a year, uh, we select somebody, a community group that uh, has supported our, our, our students in some particular way, and we award them with the Community Matters Award. And um, we have two, two things to discuss as it relates to that. First of all, uh, whether uh, whether we have the criteria that we're all wanting for the selection of that award, and then secondly, uh, we need two two volunteers, either the two that have been have done it for the last couple of years, or others who wish to be um, wish to take on this task. I'll, I'll go on. Uh, well, let, let's look at the criteria first. Okay, um, you see, we've all had a chance to read the criteria. Are we happy with that criteria? Trustee Wilson. No. <laughs> no. I anticipated that. Yes, I believed uh, yeah. that you would. I still believe that there are um, individuals in our community who make a marked difference on the outcome of a child in more than one school in our district. And I still think that, you know, they may not qualify in a way that we think they can, but they should, certainly should be known. I mean, when Carol Timoth Timothy received her award and it was recognized as Big Brothers Big Sisters, it wasn't them. It was Carol Timothy. And she is the one who came and received the award as a volunteer for that organization. I think that we should implement it into here that individuals can be nominated. Highly possible they won't make it, but they should be considered. If I see in the top of the paragraph, it says second line, many individuals and organizations contribute countless hours. Isn't that who, who this is aimed at? No. Or is it just aimed at organizations? At this point, the criteria does not include an individual. It has in the past. Yes. Yeah. It has in the past. So and, the, and that I thought when the discussion we had prior to the last awards, because of that, the timeline was too quick for us to make any adjustments. Now would be the time for us to make that adjustment because that's what it was intended for right from the beginning. And I think it, leaving individuals out of it is is yeah not the intent. Trustee Anderson. When I look at this, uh, and I know that um, Trustee Latham and I had discussed this, um, that if you give it to one individual, there's so many more involved. Why wasn't I part, you know, it, it, in that recognition? But when I'm going over this, there's also a compromise. Another way of doing it is looking at an individual and a organization. And w can we not have two if if one if it comes up that way, well, that's that's a decision for the board to make. Yes, that's why I'm bringing it up. So, um, well, um, uh, let, let's let, let's do this by a, a consensus. Okay, uh, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, the, yo, okay, May sorry. May I just ask a question before we go to the consensus piece? Looking, looking at the background mm -hmm. comment that Trustee Newfeld pointed out, that it says many individuals and organizations, uh, individuals and organizations, so there's an allusion there to the individual. But when we move down Just to point two, it says if the nominee is an organization, also that tells me that at some point we're looking or thinking about a nominee that's not an organization. So I know we've had this question before and I'm hoping somebody has information. 
Was it always individual? And, and I know Trustee Wilson has cited an, an individual winning it. Was that a one year only language or was it up to that point? And then I'm just, I just wanna know, was this a consistent piece before that was just We have changed? not been consistent with it. We have definitely not been. When we first laid it out, it was an individual or, or an organization. And then, and then without, uh, then uh, this, we, we informally decided it would be not include individuals. Now our decision today is to decide whether we wish to include individuals. And this would be, we're gonna make a decision then that's gonna stay and not get changed going forward every year based on who's uh, on the committee. I'm assuming that, although it, the board, you know, the board is at the, the will of the board, uh, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Okay, can we go by consensus? How, um, uh, how many, oh, you comment or? No. No, how many would like to have individuals included? Okay, so consensus says we will, uh, and I don't think our language would have to change because no. it, it doesn't have to change. Well, if, if we could, number two, if you could say if the nominee is not an individual but an organization, that would. But th doesn't it already say that? Well, well not adding more words. Clear. I think I'm adding individual in there <laughs> for clarification. So, I don't know. Um, what else could they be if they're not an organization? Well, <laughs> let's just spell it out clearly so we're not confused. Just to make it very, very clear. Sometimes you have yep. to leave one. Yep. So we'll Anyways. leave it. We'll leave it to oh, the two people that are sure. on the committee to make sure that they clarify that and it can be an individual. And Chair Peterson, who are those two people? I don't know. Who would? Who wishes? To, <laughs> who wishes to step forward? No. Uh, I heard Trustee Anderson. Sure. Oh, we have, <laughs> we have the same. Same Might committee. As well finish what we started. All right, you're going to finish. <laughs> right. Clear the muddy water, will you? Thank you for taking that on. Much and, appreciation. And yeah, you're much welcome. appreciation. Yep. And and the rest of us are going. Phew, not that we don't <laughs> like the award. It's there's a process that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. That finished kind of our educational matters. Uh, we look at operations and the first. Oh, we have a question period. I always forget that. Yes. So this is the time when we, we put aside uh, uh, up to 10 minutes for any questions from our audience on matters that have been discussed in the, in the uh, agenda to date. And if you have a question, we ask you to step forward, state your name, and address that question to me. Um, and I may refer to, refer to somebody else to answer. And there's a second question yeah, period after you. as well. So Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Leanne Lucky, I'm for Teachers Union. Um, I just had a question regarding, I read through this report, <laughs> not yeah. the uh, one that was put up on the screen. Yeah. Um, I, I was just curious on the organizational health page. Uh, for the target measures, you have percentages listed for the first two, 70%, 12.10%, and then the bottom 7.1.3 and 7.1.4, it's not in percentages. We were wondering what that target was looking at. Is it still in percentages of all staff? And I, I can't answer that question, so... Uh, You're looking at 7.1.3 and 7.1.4? Yes. So some of the things down you see in the strategies are we don't tip, we may not have a measure for so 7.1.3 is implement bring your best program yes so that is about an implementation of a program so sometimes we measure that by have we implemented the program uh, and and you know once you implement something you make changes along the way so things like that we may not have a specific measure for okay okay so and the same thing with the other one is develop and implement an effective uh, occupational health uh, and safety program. So that is about building the program. There may not be a measure for that. That's why the important measure is up at the at this two digit 7.1 uh, around the increase in health and well-being. So mm -hmm. 7.1 talks about increasing the health and well-being. There's a measure and a target and then the strategies underneath we may measure them and we may just put a uh, more of an anecdotal measurement in terms of it's on target, uh, we completed implementation or things like that. Okay, can I ask a second question? Please? Yes. Sure. Um, so just going back to 7.1.3, it says that it's off target with 9.2 um, employee absences. So we were wondering what the target for that actually is. Would you be able to answer that question? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Michelle might be able to share that. Okay, if you want. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. Um, She's here. And, so yeah. First of all, the, those are percentages. The one is... Um, 
You're right. They're not percentages. One is average days. Okay. And the other one is a rate from work saves. Okay. Thank you. And it's off target because we wanted to reduce and we're going up. Oh, okay. That was what was not clear to me. Yeah. Thank you. That's Great. It. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Leanne, for that. Okay. So operations. Uh, and this, we're going to be on, on the important topic for most here. Uh, King Traditional Elementary. I'll turn that over to and, you. Uh, oh, all right. Tanya's here again, so Thank I'll you. Uh, turn it over to her to uh, speak to the staff report and give us an update. Okay, well, I want to thank the parent delegation for providing such an excellent summary of the last uh, two years and eight months. Um, it is also contained in the staff report here. Um, basically, as reported last year at this time, um, the district has followed through on uh, what we can do to escalate um, the health concerns that are ongoing. They're being brought to our attention in the form of symptoms from staff and definitely concerns for parents uh, and, and students as well. So the district uh, has taken steps to address the issue. We escalated it initially to uh, bylaw City of Abbotsford, Ministry of Agriculture, finally um, Fraser Health, uh, WorkSafe BC, both Prevention and Claims Division, and of course the Ministry of Environment. Uh, when we escalated the level of the Ministry of Environment, it was confirmed that they are uh, fully accountable for managing outdoor air quality standards uh, related to uh, industry, um, such as the mineral composting facility that did open up in March of uh, 2017. Um, we have been in ongoing consultation with the Ministry of Environment on this issue moving forward, uh, the concerns on a regular basis. Uh, as well, uh, we do have WorkSafe BC claims that are ongoing. Um, the Prevention Division uh, provided some advice to us along with Fraser House uh, when they came and they audited um, the site and what was going on and the concerns. They recommended um, that we did uh, take an assessment of the air. We hired a pension a third party to try as best they could to capture um, the uh, odor event, as they would call it. Um, this test... Uh, as recommended by Fraser Health, because I will let you know that um, as manager of organizational health and safety, um, our business is not generally to test outdoor air measures. I had personally hoped that one of our ministries or organizations for the safety physical health ministry would environment that work, but as best we could to capture the odor event. They recommended the things that we would test for from a manure processing plant would be uh, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and of course, total volcanic organic compounds. Um, at the time we tested, they were found to be in the accepted current ambient air quality objectives um, for indoor air quality guidelines, so it did meet. Um, capturing the odor event is a challenge, hmm. um, and uh, as such, we look at this as a baseline. Um, and it's our hope to be able to try again um, and to see if, in fact, uh, we're able to capture um, the odor um, as it stands today. This would be two years later um, to try to see if uh, the symptoms uh, that are constantly coming forward to our attention that we are concerned about uh, are related to a public health issue. Okay. Trustee Wilson and Trustee Pulse. Trustee Wilson. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I just I do want to mention a, a few things. Um, so I have a couple questions, a couple comments. Some will be more for St. Velasak, um, but I do want to comment that I drive on the number one and I come up to Mount Lehman mm -hmm. and I can smell it, and it is rank, and that's with me in my car with my windows up. So I'm very disturbed by that, just as a person traveling down the highway. Um, and um, I wanted to mention that this is a community that has a mountain elementary where the Ministry of Education was involved. I'm sure you heard about that. The issue being that they hadn't taken the covers off the air vents, but nonetheless, people were getting sick, and it was very real, and children were sick and adults were sick, and that was, I can't remember what year that was, but very significant, very public, 
very real um, for a brand new school. Um, this is a, a valley that has a lot of airshed issues. We successfully fought SE2, so I'm thinking that we shouldn't be stopping at just, oh, we have no place to send this to because we're supposed to phone the person and, and have, you know, it's like going to knock on our next door neighbors to say, I don't like what you're cooking. All right, like it's hello. Um, there's got to be some other avenue for that. Um, so well, I'm going to talk about that for a minute. I will have one more thing after that for SC Velostep, but um, I'm just, and this is more for the board, is that perhaps we should, while I recognize that SC Velostep has written a letter and it's to the Ministry of Environment, we have a Ministry of Education that's responsible for these students as well. And um, if but if Mayor Braun is, you know, concerned about it, um, and his hands are tied, ours are not, we can approach our Ministry of Education that this is a school in our community that's being affected by something that we can't, we don't have any communication tools for. So I think that there is an avenue for us in that regard. So that's a, a comment that you can address to the board. But my final comments um, are for... A, a different matter which we can come back to if you like, but it is around um, uh, a policy or a procedure because I've, I've um, had calls about this and I've also seen it in the media and I've heard a couple different schools having the same issue with different material that parents just handing out the information about how to get to the wrap line was um, not allowed on school property. And I'm kind of concerned about that because mm. if parents passing information to parents, it's not really political. Um, this is to you, SD Velostek, or to the superintendent because this is, you know, they have the capacity to share their information with each other. It's not really political because they're not, it's not an election. That was the intent of that kind of distribution of material. So, um, of any of the elections. So I think that this is a slightly different situation. Um, and even if they want to have a conversation about what the board is doing with the school, there's actually in our um, APs that PACs are allowed to communicate to the board. It doesn't withstand going through um, the principal of, of a school, and that's in our, our APs. Um, it actually, that AP excludes any communications to the board. So um, in terms of uh, materials on school property and communicating. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, and we can certainly talk about that again. I hope somebody else wants mm -hmm. to chime in on that. But um, so two things, one I'm concerned about where parents might not be able to share the information about who to contact. Um, and secondly, that the um, even if they do it in a PAC meeting, because it's just sharing, but the um, in terms of our our capacity to assist in this, um, going just back to the company is a dead end. That's not going to happen or help. Um, but we do in our capacity. We have a direct co-governance role apparently with, with the Ministry of Education. We should use it. Trustee Balls. A um, couple things from, from me. Um, I do support what my colleague, uh, the points that she has just brought up. I have a question around uh, the Right to Farm Act as it relates to um, precedents or case histories of it being beside a public facility where children are in other places in this province where those kinds of gases have been given off. There's one thing if you're out in the middle of nowhere, which that school happens to be. It is in agricultural farmland, and but the school was there pre-existing prior to this farm starting up. So I'm curious to know, and I know we're not the legal department, <laughs> we, our scope only goes so far, but is there some kind of pressure we can apply to the Ministry of Environment to let us know how many times they allow a farm like this with such toxic gases, even if it's within their parameters of what they think is safe and healthy, exists in other places, in that proximity as in directly across the street from a building housing children. I mean, not to take anything away from our adult staff in the building, of course, we're concerned about them too, but I think the leverage point is the fact that we have developing lungs and children and, and those sorts of things in proximity to this. So that was one piece of information that I thought we could use as leverage uh, to pursue this. And uh, a comment that Ms. Godet made in her presentation and Pardon me because I couldn't find it in her, her written piece that she submitted, um, but I'm pretty sure that I heard her say that she has a comment, a response from the Minister of Environment using the terms 
um, illegal and unauthorized operation. And I would like to know that if we have somebody in government actually confirmed as having said that, how, how, how is that possible if, if it continues and they're allowed? So I would like further clarification on those terms. If you can speak to that, please. I won't be able to speak to your first point, um, uh, Trustee Pauls, uh, as I think it's a, a really great question for the ministry uh, and one that we haven't uh, yet asked them as far as the history um, and is this, is this usual. Uh, as far as the second uh, question, I actually think um, Ms. Goodett might be in a better position to speak to the letter that came from the minister, I believe it was to the parents. It was to me. Yeah, and, and I, I do believe I have a copy of it here. Somewhere. I don't think we received a copy of that letter that validates that statement as having mm -hmm. come from the minister. It mm -hmm. was in 2018. Yeah. After both yes, To answer, if you could clarify for yeah. us that we so could be provided after we with sent that. The petition out, I received a letter from George Hyman, Mr. Hyman, and he said that, and he's, I can send you a copy if you would like, but it, mm -hmm. it said at the bottom, it was an illegal, um, unauthorized, illegal operation. Mm -hmm. And that was on his letter to me. It's the last page of the attachment mm -hmm. staff report. Okay. okay. And then I'm, somehow I managed to miss that. Okay. But I thank you for that response. But I would like to reiterate <coughs> that, you know, I think back to Aaron Brockovich, and I think, where is the case history that says that we know that children are safe yeah. in that environment? Thank so you. I would, I would leverage that. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and before we get pa past that, I want to go back to uh, Trustee Wilson's question, uh, the concern about handing out information to the parents. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have something on that. I was going to answer. No. I do not. What I wanted to say was that in, our, in the November 26th letter, that's your first attachment that I've written to the Ministry of Environment, we narrowed down the specific question around uh, risk um, of health and safety related to air quality standards and emissions and have asked for a specific response on that. My understanding is that they're preparing a response for us regarding that, and that, that I think will help us determine our next steps. Um, but I think there's a process here, and, and you raised the Right to Farm Act, and, and I think that that's why you've seen the municipality and a lot of these other organiz I mean, uh, organizations not be able to address it because there's some, some pretty firm legislation that I'm not 100% familiar with either. Um, but regardless, I think that getting the response from the ministry on the specific questions that we've asked in that letter will, again, point, give us the next step of where, where, we, where we go. And so, uh, bringing the Ministry of Education uh, in, in, into the discussion, I think, is not an unreasonable uh, course of action and, and possibly could, could do that as well. But. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we have to follow the steps along the way because this is a place where we don't have jurisdiction. Uh, this is not our ministry. So this, we're relying on other ministries, other authorities having jurisdiction, and they're telling us what the, the rules are. So we're, we're pushing up against the boundaries of those uh, and trying to, you know, maneuver that. But that is, that is what we're doing. So you can go back to the... Uh, minister's letter of March 15th in the staff report where he talks about the the issue and how it's being addressed and then follow the, the paper trail through mm -hmm. that they're going through the process of getting certification and getting different permits and things to operate the, that uh, facility and you know we just need to follow along the process we can't uh, as the as a school district take away their license to operate Somebody else is going to have to do that. That's not that's not our. We're not the authority having jurisdiction. So somebody else is going to have to do that. We have to help point the the decision makers in, you know in our favor, if you will. Okay, and Trustee Newfell. So, so I think one way. I mean, number one is this board and this district cares about the air quality at King, traditional, don't think this hasn't been a conversation around this table. It has been. And I think one way for us to support that would be for us as a board to send a letter to the Ministry of Education mm -hmm. along with the petition that was signed by the parents and put some pressure on him to bend or the ear of the Minister of Environment. And yes, and if we could have a copy of that 
You do. Yeah. Well, we've got a copy. I think we have a copy of the petition that. Yes. Yeah, we do. We do. staple that to a nice yeah. strong letter. I, um, uh, well, let, let's let's settle that. Let's settle that issue here right now. Uh, uh, how many feel that we we need to do that? Okay. So that we will we will. Um, we'll, uh, you know, we haven't been able to get other ministries to take care of it. Maybe we can. You know, get the one who's most closely connected to us to. Yeah. And and then Trustee oh, okay. Wilson. Uh, thank Trustee you for Mason. letting me speak again, Chair Peterson. I just wanted to mention, because um, Trustee Paul's reminded me of this um, when she raised the Farm Act, and Trustee Paul's and Trustee Rye might remember this, but there was a school production of rats that was supposed mm -hmm. to happen with King Traditional. And what happened was, while well, we were in a, um, in a theater rehearsing this at the Abbey, Abbotsford Art Center, um, the health um, director of health for the Fraser Health Actually, he was the BC one. Anyways, somebody in authority came in and shut our school down because there was an incident of um, possible avian flu in the duck farm right across the road from the drop-off. So is there something else to cite? Yes, absolutely. There is, and it's on record at Fraser Health. So I wanted to raise that because I know that at least three of us at that table have a recollection because we were all in <laughs> we were all in the building. when, And I think our school was shut for four or five days. Um, King Traditional. Just went down and sent everybody home. And yep. they had to come it's in with laws. equipment and stuff. And yeah, and events. we were not allowed even to return to the building okay. for anything. Was it five or six, maybe? Ma maybe even. There was quite a number of 2005, days. 2005, maybe 2006. Yeah, Around there. Yes, I think, yeah, somewhere in there. So, well, there is pre so there is precedence. There is we, precedent. We got we to gotta find that right button, and we will continue to look for that for sure. Yeah. And well, you already asked the question about writing a letter to the Minister of Education or Ministry, which I know our SC cautioned us uh, against. I just want to remind, I, first of all, thank you to the table, because the ministries are a beast of government. Mm -hmm. And um, so while it's not our jurisdiction, it certainly is there, whether it's the Ministry of Environment operating in a silo next to the Ministry of Education, it, it goes up the pipes and Absolutely. eventually they'll connect. So Absolutely. thank you. See you later. So I guess my question is around um, uh, how we're documenting this. So you talked about, um, you know, testing the odor, and when it was tested, it was below, um, I guess, the, the legal whatever limit. Um, they met public health standards what, what they what they grabbed out of the air. Right. We so so are, there must be times when it's worse than other times, or is it a consistent? It's it's not a consistent thing. There's times of day. It seems seasons. It will uh, just happen. And and basically, what we have to do, um, it's detailed in the proposal from the um, from Hinchin. Um, but what we have to do is dispatch someone to site at the time of an odor event. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they can they can they can pass. Uh, sometimes things can affect it like wind. Sometimes things can affect it like cold. And so really, um, there's some subjectivity into being able to dispatch um, a specialist. Um, but basically, what we're aiming to do is to mimic the original test, but to capture it at the height of an odor event. It may take a week long or more to capture those samples and to demonstrate um, in as much as we can, um, are things worse mm -hmm. today? Um, is there anything that's beyond what public health standards would expect and anticipate? And I, I would think that any time um, that it is worse, even if somebody just wrote down the day and the time, and they're, I mean, maybe that's already happening. I see Latham, we have extensive data logs thanks to our staff on site, and the principal has effectively managed that um, throughout. Uh, it, it has been quite an undertaking, so I have those files provided them to Fraser Health. Ministry of Environment, et cetera. The thing about it is, is it's a subjective, mm. right. it's a subjective analysis. Um, and so it's based on, mm -hmm. and we all have a different sense about that. Um, at the end of the day, I think the more um, helpful data here from my lens, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm a safety professional, um, are the symptoms. Mm. Um, so regardless of whether or not the, this meets public health standards, um, we, we do have people who are experiencing symptoms. Uh, we had a nuisance uh, level of H2S gas in the air that was found 
it's a nuisance level, it meets public health standards, it will still cause um, an extreme uh, ammonia. Yeah. Uh, ammonia definitely comes off these type of manure facilities, um, and it can meet public health standards. It can still make you, you weep and cry a little bit. And so I think the question that um, uh, that Ray has, has just mentioned that um, we've put to the Ministry of the Environment is really, really clear. It's why we escalated this to them. Mm -hmm. The concerns being brought forward are health concerns. People have real health concerns, and we would like them to help us understand, is there a health issue or not? Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I'm really looking forward to their okay. next work. It, okay, sorry, I just, want, I just wanted to, just, can I follow up? Just, yeah, just, if, you, if you can go to your attachment mm -hmm. uh, on the staff report, and, and just sort of scroll down past the newspaper article to the, to the email from uh, the Ministry of Environment. And, and there's, you see the, res the response to uh, some previous correspondence that Tanya sent to them. But, you know, in the last paragraph, it is, you know, considering that we've gone for two years, uh, sending lots of information to them. Uh, the previous email to this was, I think, that, well, we haven't received any concerns. Uh, when, like, on, on day one or two, when it, it came to Tanya's attention, she's emailing the ministry and still we haven't had any concerns and then a month later this letter comes after we've uh, after the rap line has been inundated with calls after Tanya's emailed you know a number of times uh, to, to, to you know comment that we've experiencing the uh, the serious odor issues again the letter here I just find dismissive from mm -hmm. from the ministry around we don't have the power to regulate odor um, <laughs> yes, that you do. <laughs> that direct complaint communication should be should be sent to the company now, uh, and don't use the wrap line anymore. Exactly. I, I just found that quite dismissive from from the Ministry of Environment, and and I I think that we, you know, that's why we sent the next letters. I think we deserve a little bit better response than that when when the symptoms <coughs> are causing people to be unwell, if you will. Um, Ray, exactly. It was October 9th and we were hearing feedback from, uh, from staff and from parents and I, I said, Stuart, can we please get an update on this? Um, and he said, we haven't had any, um, any issues reported to the RAP line. Uh, let me check in with the company. <laughs> and then about a month later, just over a month, I said, Stuart, can we please get an update on this? People are still, from the beginning of the year, experiencing all kinds of symptoms. And we got this answer back, which was, you know, they're coming into compliance, we do not regulate odor, et cetera. And so I, I actually think um, when we get into talking about odor, that is where things get murky. Um, and WorkSafe said it, Fraser Health said it, everybody said it. When you talk about odor, they get murky. We really need clarity on health. Mm. That's where we're, that's where we're focused here. Uh, I think it was Trustee Ride first and then a couple of questions. Uh, one, after the one that I can make out from here, that they got the fourth inspection and the fourth warning sometime in 2018. Yes. Have they not done no other inspection after that? Um, All of 2019? It's a really great question. <laughs> uh, I'm just... Yeah, it's, I don't. it's possible. Uh, and uh, I don't have any evidence that they've actually gone to site and inspected it. What I understand uh, is that Following that, that was around the time the SCODAT received the, um, the letter from the, the minister that said illegal operation. I think that was around that time. That's 2018. Following, exactly. Following that, they've, uh, as Stuart put it, shown willingness to comply. Uh, and I think, I think we've moved away from that inspection prevention direction for the ministry. But that said, I don't mean to conjecture that much. Stuart, uh, the Ministry of Environment, they don't answer to me. So I'm of course, asking uh, a question. Oh, I know. Yeah. No, thank you for, for doing <laughs> everything you're doing. But, if they uh, did. <laughs> but it, it, it's kind of frustrating that we don't hear back. And, and they're, we, like, they should be looking into this. My second, sorry, my second question on this is, um, we did the, and I know it's, it's all conjecture. Yes. About the, the testing. The testing. Yes. We did that about two years ago. We did it about two years ago this time. I can, I can, no, I'm it's sorry. Fine. I didn't bring everything with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, we did it. Actually, I, I believe it was in December of 2017. So just at the end of the first year that this happened, 
Um, and so we really did dispatch um, Pynchon on a subjective, basically the principal would say, okay, how is it? Is it a four out of four with odor today? Okay, we need to get them here. And sometimes um, they would come out, the odor would be gone, they'd have to go back and come another day. So um, are we getting something else done in the uh, near yes. future? We're going to repeat that test um, with the same idea, and I think really we want to catch it, what it's like today when it's really, really bad, and when these uh, complaints are coming forward. We're going to do our best. Maybe we should give them beddings and let them lie down there yeah. till it's bad, <laughs> and then take it. Well, this oh, is like... Go ahead. And then no, I, just, I just think that sometimes it disappears <coughs> for a couple of months, yes. and then when it comes back, it's really bad. And there's, there's times of the year, I think in the, in the spring it gets bad, and in, in fall, for two months in the fall, I think it's probably when it's the worst. It follows, um, it follows our seasonal eating patterns, uh, right? When the um, poultry are slaughtered, um, there will be a change, and when the... Um, when the litter is collected, there will be a change. And so there's a time when it amasses and then there's a time when it goes away and it follows things like Christmas and Thanksgiving and, and big events. So you two, you know way too much about I, this. <laughs> <laughs> but not enough, apparently. Mm -hmm. So my along along the same lines, my brain is still, and I grew up on a farm, I shoveled a lot of manure and a lot of compost in my life. And I would like to request that there is a... It, you know, the, the term voluntary compliance was used in that letter that the farmer, but also in the act that they said enforcement is on a voluntary basis, which means there's no teeth. That's what the government's yep. way of saying no teeth is, for one thing. But if they're being, if they're expressing an interest in cooperating, I would like the testing to align with the churn cycle, which is what you just talked about, because that's when the bulk of the gases are released, is when that seasonal time comes when you're turning your pile over, the composting and the uh, literally, it can combust. I mean, I, we, I've been dealing with straw in my life where we've had barn fires because of compost that started fires. There's that much toxic stuff going on internally to the pile that you would never know until you churn. So if they are willing to give up their churn cycle, whether it's seasonal or whatever those dates are, so that the testing can be done with the churn cycle, I think that might impact their findings. So just... Yeah, I've cleaned a few chicken barns. Well, uh, so um, while we're not in the same situation as, as the students and the parents and the community and the teachers, um, you know, there's a collective frustration here. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope, you know, some some testing. I hope and we hope that the reports, uh, the, the health reports, are, uh, will have some effect. I mean, we want it to stop now, and uh, you know, and the frustration part, frustrating part. It doesn't sound like we can do that. I don't know. Uh, but we'll write our letter, and, and we'll do that in a, in a timely manner, and the testing will continue, and we'll keep, uh, we'll keep our parents informed, um, and, you know, uh, and we'll continue to remain frustrated until, until this is solved. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the collective, collective will at some point will, will solve this issue. So thank you, and thank you. You know, I, I don't think you wanted to ever know this much about poop in your life, but you, you, you do now, and... Uh, uh, thank you for your work with this. So, since we just had the BCSTA and we had uh, uh, Dr. Suzuki's daughter there about activism, I'm wondering what it would take if we would block the road for the trucks to get in and out of the facility, if we would stop their cash flow, if they would listen a bit more. I'm not suggesting anything, but I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. Um, Tanya. <laughs> Thanks, Tanya. Trustee Anderson. This is for Superintendent Gordon. Is that um, on there? And I don't know whether it was answered or, or, or not. But why can't we hand out the Ministry of Pollution phone number on school grounds? I don't. I don't have any information about that. I have not investigated that, so I'm not in a position to really answer your question. So I'll have to find out the circumstances behind okay. that. Okay, but there we don't have any policy about anything like that. So it could be just misinformation. Potentially, I just don't have the facts. Could you okay. get that back to us some, by email or something? Because we don't need it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to have you hold on that. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Questions. Okay. <laughs> but we will investigate. Just so rest assured, we will well, investigate I know the, that. The reason. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, with that, we're looking at next our quarterly financial report. Okay.
Okay, this is a uh, September 30th financial report. Uh, nothing to report of significance. I'll just draw your attention if you happen to notice one thing that's a little bit um, higher than, than we anticipated, or not than we anticipated, but higher than, than last year is in employee benefits. And that's related to the uh, increased cost we have for MSP, which is funded by, we get a grant from that, uh, for that from the province. So uh, that is one area on the expenditure side that is, is a little bit uh, higher than we would have uh, seen compared to last year. So that's the only item I have to report on. But if you have any questions, I will take them. Questions? Hearing none, let's move on. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> the last item uh, in my report is just to, um, um, you know, a big, big thanks to the HR team for uh, working to get our collective agreement with our support staff ratified. It has now been ratified by all parties and uh, we will just need to do the paperwork and arrange for signing of documents and uh, it's, it's been a long, I think nine months or 10 months of, of or 11 months of bargaining. And uh, as always with bargaining, it's been a very interesting experience, but uh, we've reached agreement within the provincial framework, which is uh, the requirement. And uh, I think that uh, in the end, a good deal for our support staff and for the district. Great. Questions or comments? And again, thank you to our HR staff and our bargaining team for, for that. It's a difficult process. Huh? Okay, uh, reports by representatives on external organizations. And I think, Trustee Latham, you... Can I make one? Yeah, I, yes. Um, I don't know if anybody else on any city committee has heard. Uh, at the last PRC meeting, we were told, surprise to everybody on the committee, that was our last meeting. We might not have another meeting at all. They're reconfiguring all their committees at City Hall without any word to any committee member. I felt bad for the citizens of our community who've been spending years on PRC. We're not given a, given a heads up. So our meetings for January were canceled until further notice, until the city requests if any trustees are needed on any committees at City Hall. So I'm wondering about transportation. I'm wondering about any other committees that members are a part of. Um, I think the city's rejigging everything. And of course, rather timely that we're looking at our committee participation and it, we may have to do it again once yeah. after. So nobody else has heard anything? <clears throat> Trustee Wilson. Wow, okay. I just want to comment on um, what Trustee uh, Newfeld has raised. Um, and this is one that always has concerned me the most, especially after we have raised the matter of the um, joint use agreement already in June, I believe we met with Mayor and Council, um, that you know, this is an agreement between uh, two parties, two political organizations, legal entities um, in local government, and that we're not even included in the discussion. Yes, it's their committee, but it's jointly our joint use agreement, and I would like us to pursue a discussion on that. Okay. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see what they, what they... Could we have that on the agenda in the January meeting, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, just one second. And, uh, yes, Trustee question, Clarifying question to uh, Trustee Wilson. Do you remember, uh, I believe it was when Mayor Braun was first elected, this same thing happened. They disbanded all of the city, and I think we talked about this at that point already because of the joint use agreement, and we did have a conversation, but I don't remember what the outcome of that was. Um, well, there's actually, it's been a cycle that's taken us this far. It actually started in 2008 when Mayor Perry came and mm -hmm. re reformatted the entire um, um, composition of Parks, Rec, and Culture. Um, and then when Mayor Braun came in, he did, uh, um, and because of our concerns, he did allow one trustee to be there, but there was no other voice. Yes. Formerly, there was three of us three, on that Three council members and, and three trustees. Six years, I sat alone yep. on yep. that committee. Yes, and that's still the case, and there's st so there should have been a conversation, at least as a courtesy, um, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, for discussion in January, continued discussion. Thank All you. right. Um, and with that, so we have we have at least one report. Trustee uh, I don't want to go see. ahead. You're okay. Oh, oh, did oh, yeah. there'll be the three, I'm fine. several of us here? I, I'll, I'll fill in whatever. Okay. Well, I was going to focus because I'm 
a learner um, about strategic planning, so I was going to focus on uh, the workshops um, around the framework for enhancing student learning. So um, this is a, a ministry initiative around strategic policy, and basically they want to address two questions. Uh, the first, as a public sector, or, or as a public education sector, are we being successful? And secondly, how do we as school districts work together to improve outcomes for students? And so some of the things that they're looking at is finding common goals in the province, um, improving overall strategic planning in the province, and the reporting progress, reporting on progress, um, building capacity through continued improvement, um, and learning and supporting each other around the province. And so school districts, there's 60 of them, is that correct? Are all in different stages of strategic development. And um, so currently there are nine school districts that will engage in a pilot project. Um, they're all at different places in, in their development. So I gather the ministry is just trying to get some idea of what's going on in the province and gathering data. Um, and so there were several workshops on the topic, and there will be regional sessions that start in January. Um, I'm not going to go through um, all of my notes that I took, um, but essentially it's about you know finding common ground in a time of change and diversity. Um, I came to the school board as a trustee. Um, after the strategic plan was started and, you know, starting to work. And um, I think that our school district is really in a very good place um, compared to some other um, districts when it comes to um, strategic planning. And part of it is just the incredible work that's gone on and the fact that it encompasses our entire school district. So everybody's involved, all the departments, um, it, all the way down to stakeholders. Yes, there's work to do. There's, there's that trickle-down process that we still have to work on, I think, within our schools um, and, and with our, our stakeholders. But I really believe that um, our, our Board of Education and this school district has really paved the road and has done an incredible job. And so I think, you know, that whole notion of facilitating student success, it's always <coughs> front of mind. And any of the reports that come to us um, from the different different departments, it that's what they're talking about. Everybody's focused on um, student success. And certainly the array of students that were here tonight um, from the middle school conference you know, to me is a, a testimony to that. So, um, and I think <laughs> that other school districts are looking for our questions, you know, our question sheet mm -hmm. when we have, mm -hmm. um, and they're looking for um, things like what we got tonight, our scorecard. I mean, uh, I think they would love, um, and, and I, I assume that, it, that we'll probably share um, we'll charge. <laughs> we'll charge. but I, I'm serious. I, I think we could, <laughs> we could, we could make some money, but anyway, um, I just, so I just want to say, you know, as relatively new, I've been here five years. Um, thank you to senior staff and to my colleagues at the board table, um, for all the work that you've done and, and, you know, well done because I can tell from the other trustees <laughs> around me, they're not in the same place yeah. um, that we are in other school districts. So, I mean, I think, yeah, and we continue to, It's this isn't something that sits on a shelf. We continue to, it's like the amoeba, we continue to shape it, and each department continues to, to look at what they're doing and the work that they're doing and how can we, how can we do this better, and ultimately, it's about our students and student success. We look at the grad rates 
Um, but there's so many other things um, that, that we need to learn how to measure in terms of, of the data. It's not, not just the numbers thing. Um, it's, you know, how are our kids doing in terms of their mental health? How are they doing in terms of that collaboration um, piece that they were talking about? I mean, some of the things that those kids said. Yes. I w wish we videotaped it. Maybe they did. Maybe they did. Okay. Anyway, um, online. It live that, that's that's my share. This this uh, this part of the conference didn't get the loudest laughs, but you know I I have to learn um, as a trustee, and, and so thank Great. you. Thank you. Oh, are you going to talk about that? Uh, do you? I will, I will fill in afterwards. Okay. All right. So, <coughs> okay. Uh, just to give a further update, I'll, I'll talk more about uh, the speakers and and their topics. Uh, uh, Thursday evening, we had uh, our opening session with um, <coughs> Dr. Suzuki's daughter, and I took three pages of notes of extreme rhetoric, which was very interesting. Other than that, Friday was very good. Um, Anthony McLean uh, spoke on mental health and in inclusivity, and I have I have I have yet to see uh, someone captivate an audience as he did. And I can tell you, and they said it, students absolutely love this guy. He can rap. He can. I mean, the guy's got techno stuff going on. His personality is outgoing. He dresses hip, and and just absolute everything he said was bang on. And it, it had us all absolutely engaged for the whole 45 minutes that he spoke. And as a guy who's six, you can't be hip anymore. I'm <laughs> jealous. Uh, Saturday uh, morning, Brian Woodland spoke on uh, making public education and leadership matter in a fake news world. Uh, and this guy, you, I mean, he ran a huge district. In Ontario, massive. I don't know how was it. Peel, one hundred and ten thousand students. One hundred and ten thousand students, and the way his his short thirty second clips of of what mattered in his school and how to promote that was riveting. Like it just you got it. You knew exactly what their vision was. You knew exactly what they were doing. You exactly knew what their points were. Bang, 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 and in thirty seconds he had you, and it was well done. Anyways, and he had us going for forty five minutes, and then the last one was more of a heart tug. Uh, MP Mike Lake talked about an autism adventure. He has a son, uh, Jaden, who is on the extreme end of autistic. He's nonverbal. Um, but he actually said something to me that, that uh, it, I, I never thought of it. And he said, it's, it's not the students in our schools that are low-functioning autistic. They, they get accepted fairly well because people can see that they're different. It's the ones that can function but are just a little bit odd. They get bullied, and they have the hardest time in school. And I thought to myself, well, I never even thought of that. And, and, uh, and his, his work that he's done, uh, you can see it on, on, on YouTube if you look at uh, MP Mike Lake and just the work that he's doing just to, to show how his son has been included in absolutely every area of his school, even though he's nonverbal, is absolutely amazing. It was, it was really heartwarming and, and, and yeah, tears to your eyes, right? Just how appreciated. So I felt that BCSTA hit a home run uh, this, this uh, weekend. Uh, I, I felt I, I learned a lot and, and, and it was very, very, very engaging. So yeah, it was good. Okay, Trustee Anderson. I think they hit on the highlights. I was going to speak about some of the lowlights, but I don't think I will. <laughs> um, we'll, we, we'll just keep it to the highlights and, and keep it that way. Okay. Okay, anything else with that? Okay, that moves us on to um, trustee announcements, the exciting things we've been doing since our last meeting. And there's a million things that go on in the district, and I know some of us will get to some of them, but... Uh, oh, um, close. Just, uh, I'll just briefly fill you in on the uh, BPAC meeting while some of you were at BCSTA. Uh, I stayed back and did the uh, BPAC and uh, great education going on with our parent group. Lots of, this is full. This is full and, and people in the seats and people are interested and engaged and uh, the topics covered at BPAC uh, with our parents. Uh, they had actually a lady come from the compliance branch of gaming 
because of all of the fraud and all the things mm -hmm. that are going on to really get a presentation and she walked through for their benefit and was going to share the presentation so that it could go out to the schools on all the ways that things can go sideways with the gaming applications and why some we still have two schools in the district that are that have been non-compliant for one reason or another and how hard it is to get reinstated mm -hmm. when you've fallen down and mm -hmm. how to work through that process. So it was great to see that they're being proactive with trying to educate the schools on how to get money from the so I appreciate the presentation there. Um, Secretary Treasurer Velastuk came and did a little blurb, twice as long as he said it was going to be, in fact, on the transportation <laughs> review uh, that we will be doing to try to engage some interest there with the parents and let them know Monday. why they need to be there, why they need to get their parents out, and what kind of issues we're having and what we're looking at doing, and, uh, and that we need their input and brainstorming. So I think he did a good job of that. And then Perry Smith yeah, yeah. did a great presentation on assessment after that and talked about the new reporting format mm. and the change in descriptors and that parents aren't used to that and they don't mm -hmm. know what things mean and the kids don't know what they mean. And the teachers are really still yeah, learning, learning at the criteria yeah. that defines what the new assessment terms mean. And it was a really open and frank discussion with questions asked and Perry just has such a great way of breaking everything down and making it understandable. And I felt like I learned stuff that I didn't know coming out of that, and we've heard him talk about that a number of times, so I think that it's going to be repeat, repeat, yeah. repeat. You don't just give the information once. We've got to just keep talking about it because it's evolving and things are changing, and those terms and what they mean need to be meaningful to the parents. They don't. People are feeling right now that, that they don't understand their child's evaluation process because they don't understand the terms being used in the new in the new language. So we're trying to turn that into something that's meaningful for the parents so that they understand the new way of, of assessing. So I was glad he did some work on that with the parents. And, and that's, that's that. Okay. Okay. Others? You want, are you going to talk about the... Uh, I was going to, but you go you right ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, like no, I don't like need your sheet. sheet. Uh, no, I guess I won't get into the detail that you would be. But um, um, highlight for me was uh, Nayash Awards. Uh, and the, probably the best part, of, well, the best part is that we were recognized, but th uh, the other part was I, I, I got to sit with Tanya and some staff and I got to know some people I, you know, I hadn't met. And it, you know, I'm, they're so passionate about the work they're doing. It's, it's really, it's really, it was really a great, great time. Um, the middle school conference, we've already talked about it. I got to be there at the start of it and the energy in the place was crazy. <laughs> I, middle school teachers, there's something about them, and I think you have to be a little bit whoop whoop to be a middle school teacher. Um, and, uh, That's but the official term for there, it. Yeah, whoop, whoop, whoop. There's, a little, there's a lot of whoop whoop there, and it, it was very inspiring. And then to see these kids speak, uh, it was amazing. And then uh, Trusty Latham and I were at the secondary band night, and wow. Trustee. Oh, I, yes, yes, uh, uh, Trusty Anderson. And, you know, when I go to these, I it, it's always late, and... I close my eyes when they're, and, and it, you know, I tell you, the music is just amazing that comes from, from these groups. I mean, it, we've just gone on a, this kind of angle in, in, in improving our, our, our music uh, uh, programs. And the numbers of kids, uh, you know, I mean, it, you know, there was a time in which there were 10 people on stage, you know, playing a flugelhorn or whatever they do. And, <laughs> and now there's, gee, they're playing, I mean, they're playing every kind of instrument and there's 50 people. I'm not sure how... All they that sticks makes them play music, but they sure did. Uh, it, they were they were really quite amazing. So I'm going to add to to what you. Both yes. Recommend. Good. Good. Yes. Um, because this was the secondary school honor band night, oh, yeah. so um, a, a number of our high schools uh, participated, and so they brought their concert bands and they played, and then at the end they had worked all day with a clinician. And then they pulled together, um, and the students were from Asia, Sumas Mountain, Abbey Senior, um, ATSS, Bateman, Moat, and Yale Secondary. And I thought they had some really solid moments um, a as a group. And so, and they'd really only worked together um, that day. So this is something yeah. that happens annually. And, and thank you to I don't know what we would do without Emma Tondra. Yep. He's retired, but she keeps coming back. Yep. And so we're so grateful. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff.
Trustee Anderson. I just want to, two things. The one I enjoyed the most was that train one or whatever it was. Yes. Yeah. Uh, where it was good. But also, Abbey Traditional couldn't show up because they were playing volleyball. I think it was volleyball, and they won the tournament. Yeah. Now, they didn't think that they were oh, going to win, and uh, so they were coming to it, and, and then they, they couldn't play there. So they had to sort of fill in, but they did win the tournament. There's an interesting connection between music and athletics, right? All their volleyball players were in the in the band, so you know, yeah. Well, anything else? Okay, one last question period. Again, the same rules apply, please. Uh, we've got a maximum of ten minutes. If you have a question, please st step forward, state your name, and uh, ask your question. Yes. I don't have a question as much as I can fill in some of the blanks about what we discussed tonight, because. When we started out, we had a lot of parents involved, and it got so frustrating after a while. I've been the only one dealing with this within the parent group, which is, I have tons of support, but I'm the one who's writing letters. And so I was the one who was told by our school administrator that we could not distribute the wrap line information on school property because the school couldn't look political. And because it was a non, it wasn't, the form wasn't approved by the school district. So then he said to send it to Kayla Stucker to get approval, and that never happened. He's, I didn't hear back. So we've just been really creative in getting that out because it's the very only tool parents have is that wrap line information. So that's what happened with that. Um, we, I clarified with Stuart because our principal brought up this fact that we weren't supposed to call uh, the wrap line anymore, just to call the owners. And I clarified that with Stuart, and he says, no continue to call the wrap line, but in addition, these are the contact information for the owners of the property. Um, thirdly, this company, 93 Land Company, is also known as Nature's Nutrients, and their facility back in 2016 was shut down um, by the ALC and the city. Um, and I have since reopened, I sent in a complaint through the ALC, so that file's been reopened, with the same guy that shut them down the first time. Hmm. So he's gonna be looking into that, and he did a lot of investigating before, and they couldn't shut them, he tried his best, he would follow the trucks, he would spend hours, but he never caught them, he was so suspicious that they were up to no good, but he could never prove it. So he's back on board. Um, I've also contacted Stuart, I talked to Stuart quite often from the Ministry of Environment, and they likely will be doing another inspection soon, which is good news. Um, and I have a meeting with bylaws, city bylaws on Monday with another gentleman who's been helping us out kind of independently. Uh, we had a, a file dropped off um, by someone who wanted to name and remain anonymous. He wouldn't tell our administrative assistant who he was, but he had a bunch of information regarding the company and their their dealings, illegal kind of dealings that we've been um, looking into. Um, and my next step is to do, I'm going to apply, put a compliance, uh, non-compliance, it's through the Farm Industry Review Board. So hopefully I have that other avenue, but we're running out of options. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, I'm going to stop you there and say, thank you for your ongoing efforts. Normally, we would, I would have stopped you right at the beginning and say, unless you had a question, because we have a protocol, and that's why I couldn't respond. But I just wanted to yes. fill in some And, and because you filled in some, some information, yeah. I allowed you to continue. Normally, I would have stopped you yeah. and say, we need your question. So well, thank, thank, you. thank you for your efforts. Um, thank you. All right. I just wanted to let everyone yes. know where things are at. Appreciate that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Well, with that, I get to say to the... Huge crowd left. Mm. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and yes. Yeah, and a happy new year. Yes. All right.